Well, I think we'll make a start, if that's all right. It's been lovely to hear all of the, the chatter and uh, that people have been able to enjoy some morning tea before we get going. But we've, we've got people online who haven't been able to enjoy that nice morning tea. So we, we, we better um, move ahead, I think. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Gail Mulcair. I'm the current chair of the National Early, Learning, Early Language and Literacy Coalition. Um, and we do rotate the, the chair. So the, currently the, the chair of the coalition um, and our secretariat's been managed through Speech Pathology Australia, um, where I'm also the, the CEO of Speech Pathology Australia. Um, so I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone, um, particularly on behalf of our National Early Language and Literacy Coalition. Uh, I'd like to extend a welcome to members of the coalition, but also um, very much um, welcome representatives of the government at various levels and other stakeholders and supporters who are with us here today. Um, and um, also welcome those who are online. Uh, so we have a number of people who have joined us online who are on, on Zoom, um, and that's being broadcast live, plus will be available um, as a recording. And I think we'll probably send the link to the recording out after, uh, after our, our session. Um, so welcome to those who are, who are watching online. This is a really exciting stage of the work of the, the coalition uh, and for all working in in the early years space. And we really look forward to hearing uh, your input and, and your contributions um, throughout the day. Um, I'd like to also begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of, of the land uh, on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. We wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life of the city and region. And we'd also like to acknowledge and extend this respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are attending today's event. Um, and I'll be very pleased in a few moments to be able to introduce Professor Tom Karma, who will be speaking um, and uh, speaking in terms of an opening address and, and a further acknowledgement of country in a moment. Just to provide a bit of context um, to today's forum, we all know that early childhood, particularly the zero to five years, is a crucial time for the development of, of language and other foundations of literacy. In Australia, many children are behind their peers in early language and literacy development, well before starting school. And we know that for many, they start behind and they stay behind. And I'm sure that's why we're all here today um, with our concerted efforts to, to um, hopefully change that, say, that state. This issue matters obviously because ultimately poor literacy and communication not only costs our economy and community, but for the individual it can mean a significantly different uh, life trajectory, impacting on academic and employment outcomes and limiting full participation in society and compromising health, emotional and life outcomes. This is also an issue that crosses the domains of education, health, disability, and social services, and at levels of um, Commonwealth, state, territory, and local government. Um, and we particularly welcome many representatives of all those various sectors who are here today. And while we know that there are many useful initiatives and programs, and they've been implemented and are funded um, across the country, it's difficult to really address the issue um, as effectively as we might like without a, a nationally coordinated approach. The National Early Language and Literacy Coalition or, or NELC or the coalition I will, will use as an abbreviation because otherwise it's a, a bit of a mouthful, um, began with, with some early discussions in 2015, so quite some time ago. Um, and then the group formed more formally following an early literacy summit hosted in 2016 by, by ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association. A number of other organisations with expertise in this area were represented on that day, and it was decided that we would all work together, that it was necessary for us to work together collaboratively to coordinate and improve the approach to early language and literacy for children zero to five years across Australia. 
And the coalition uh, now has 13 member organisations. We started with 10. We've had some other organisations join us, which is wonderful. Um, so we're, we're a fairly strong body of, of um, very significant peak bodies in this area. And since that time, uh, with the very generous support of the Ian Potter Foundation, and, and I thank Nicole Batoni, who's, who's here in the room with us for that support, um, plus with um, substantial input from relevant federal, state, and territory and government um, departments, also input from researchers, practitioners, and other relevant stakeholders, we undertook, the group undertook a comprehensive literature review of policy programs and interventions, both nationally and internationally, with an emphasis on factors that have contributed to effective outcomes. It was really important at that early stage that we map what was happening. And, and certainly there's a significant amount of work that, that was happening at that time and has continued to grow. But we needed to understand that, um, but we also knew that there wasn't necessarily a national approach um, to this work at that time. So we've, we did, the group, uh, the coalition, developed a practical guide for policy developers, service providers and, and families on good practice and effective approaches in, in different contexts. We also liaised with governments on the development and adoption of a proposed national early language and literacy strategy. And the proposed strategy was launched in September 2021 and can be found on our website. And we've got Copies, um, copies on the table over there too. So that's the, the um, proposed strategy, which we're really proud of. I guess we're also, I mean, this is a fantastic time and, and opportunity, uh, not only for the work of the coalition, but for everyone, I'm sure, here in the room and, and online. Um, we're feeling really positive and hopeful uh, that the federal government's current work on developing and supporting the early years sector through a national strategy will, will include a focus on support, supporting early language and literacy and will foster collaboration between portfolios and all level of governments and at that sort of local program level. And we're really pleased to have Alexis Diamond here from the Department of Social Services and is leading, who is leading the, the work with her, her section, her division, is leading the work in terms of developing the National Early Years Strategy. So thank you, Alexis, for, for joining us today. You'll have lots of people coming and talking to you, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, um, and as a coalition, we, we stand ready to act as an expert reference group to progress necessary change and improvement so that Australia's children can have an equitable start to school and to develop the foundations for a success, successful life. I'd now like to introduce our opening speaker, um, Professor Tom Karma, who is going to give us an opening address um, and also um, provide a, a further acknowledgement of country. So Professor Tom Karma is an Aboriginal elder from Kungarakan, please correct me if I'm saying that incorrectly, um, and the Iwaja tribal group, whose traditional lands are southwest of Darwin uh, and on the Coburg Peninsula in the Northern Territory. Professor Karma, or I know he wants me to call him Tom, um, has been involved in Indigenous affairs at a local community, state, national and international level, focusing on rural and remote Australia, on health, mental health, suicide prevention, education, justice reinvestment, research, reconciliation and economic development. His work during this time as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission has been credited for laying the foundation for the Close the Gap campaign. And in 2008, Professor Karma delivered the formal response to the government's national apology to the stolen generations. Aside from his role as co-chair of the Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation, which is one of the members of, of our coalition. He is currently the Chancellor of the University of Canberra, National Coordinator for Tackling Indigenous Smoking, Co-Chair of Reconciliation Australia, and alongside Professor Marsha Langton, he's the Co-Chair of the Indigenous Voice to Parliament Advisory Group. 
And in January this year, Professor Karma was recognised as the Senior Australian of the Year for 2023. And congratulations again, Tom, on this very well-deserved recognition. And I think we should all give it a applause. We were very fortunate also to have uh, Professor Karma provide an opening address when we launched the National Early Language and Literacy Strategy in September 2021. And we now welcome Tom, Professor Karma, to the floor to deliver an acknowledgement of country and to introduce our forum today. Thank you. Right. Always happens when you want to see when you want to do it quickly. Never works. Okay. Well, um, thank thank you, Gail, and uh, and hi everybody, both in person and online. Can I also? provide an acknowledgement to country in recognising the Ngunnawal peoples who are the, the traditional custodians of the land here and land that's also shared with the Ngambri people and, and a couple of other groups who are, are laying claim to, to Canberra, which is quite understandable because Canberra was a bit of a meeting place and a convergence of, of, um, of different tribes here um, in, in the region. Uh, but in, in addition to acknowledging the elders, I also wanted to to acknowledge and recognise their youth as I do with all youth who are going to be our future leaders, the custodians of our stories, our cultures, our histories and our languages. And, and I think, and particularly us as, and as the coalition who spend all of our time looking at children, we need to recognise that. And as I say to, to uh, bureaucrats and other policy makers, we also need to, to listen and hear what, what our youth are saying, because um, some of us might still think we're young, but um, we might be young at heart, but uh, we're not quite up to up to scratch with um, with everything else that's happening. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few words um, at today's forum. I've been involved with early years language and literacy with the ALNF since 2009, and now as co-chair of ALNF, as been mentioned, uh, for over a decade now. And I wanted to recognise Mary Ruth Mendel, not Rendell, as in the in the program, but Mendel, um, who's been, uh, who's co-chair with me. The first time I welcomed participants to talk about early language and literacy was back in 2016, when it was my great pleasure to give the opening address at the very first National Literacy Summit. The Australian Libraries and Information Association, as Gail's mentioned, organised that very first summit. The aim then was to bring together people who placed a high value on children's accessing a quality education because their literacy abilities uh, gave them skills to do so. That day's conversations revolved around the common understanding that strong development in early language and early literacy across the zero to five year uh, of age was uh, crucial to underpin later successful reading and writing acquisition and hence access to good education with lifestyle options and choices. As we say at ALNF, so that children can write their own bright futures. Evolving from the momentum of that very first summit, the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition formalised as the working group of talented people who in 2021 produced the proposed National Early Language and Literacy Strategy, as has been mentioned, and, and I'd urge you to have a look at that if you get the opportunity. A quality document of strategic direction, uh, directions and uh, recommendations. Uh, there's also um, a copy on the, on the website if you need it. I congratulate the coalition on this important work that is recognised as a substantial contribution um, uh, within the collective representation that uh, the current Commonwealth Government is reviewing for the much welcomed early years strategy uh, that we're all, all so thrilled that's occurring. Thank you, Alexis. We look forward to, to, uh, to chatting with you over the day. As a newish grandfather of a delightful, chatty little grandson, I can say with absolute certainty that like me, parents and grandparents, aunties and uncles, want the very best opportunities for their own children, their community's children, and for all Australian children. All of us here know that a little one who has a strong speaking and listening skills is going to explore their own world with ever increasing curiosity and confidence, navigating, and building relationships 
and friendships as they go. We also know that nearly 30% of under five-year-old uh, children do not start school with strong communication skills. These vulnerable children are, for the most part, living in vulnerable communities. For most, unfortunately, a cycle of disadvantage rotates through the generations. Changing that outcome must include providing community-led, community-involved practical programs that break through the transgenerational hand-me-down of low literacy by uplifting literacy levels. And that has to begin in the early years and, uh, and begin prior to, to formal schooling even. The problems just compound for children in these communities with literacy challenges. We know that a protective factor for health and well-being is education. We also know that those children who start school behind stay behind. Not having a strong start in the early years can have a far reaching ramification uh, that negatively impacts health and happiness and generally passes from one generation to the next. Multiple disadvantage factors compound each, each other, creating a vicious cycle where low education perpetrates poor health as well as early exits from high school, low employment and job uh, retention rates, increased uh, trauma episodes, suicide, deep sadness. You know, we can go on at all the, the disadvantages of not having a, a good start to, uh, to your education journey. This cycle is underpinned by low literacy and poor communication skills. It is more than a glass ceiling. It's a rock hard cap, um, restricting people from participating in a productive society. Breaking that cycle um, needs two things to happen. We need to start supporting children and families and educators in the very early years with secondly, the very elements you as a group know are essential, strong early language and literacy growth. Closing the gap on health involves closing the education gap. Since our first summit in 2016, the conversation has matured. The Commonwealth and, very sta and various state governments have responded to calls to address many aspects within the early years envelope. And the early years strategy, which has been mentioned, will generate strategic and systemic change. But it is a very competitive space as there are multiple aspects needing attention. And we know uh, even now that we're in an environment where, where the, uh, the government's indicating that there's not a lot of money around. Uh, so it is competitive you know, at all levels of schooling, right up to, to higher education. The early year strategy aspires to share the future of Australia's children and their family, no, sorry, aspires to shape the future of Australia's children and their families, recognises how critical the early years for children's development and continued success over a lifetime, and is committed to creating a more integrated, holistic approach to the early years and to better support education. But a word of caution, the key skills of strong language and literacy development in the early years must not get overlooked or the strategy's aspirations of continued success over there, and that is the children's lifetime, will not be achieved. Without the inclusion of well thought out plans and the funding that needs to go with these plans to support communities to achieve local strong early years language and literacy capacity, these aspirations and the intersection between health and education will not be positively impacted. I encourage all here today to ensure that your expert knowledge in early language and literacy is heard and included in the strategy plans. I recommend that governments access and be guided by your expertise formally and regularly. I'd like to see an advisory group of coalition members routinely invited and funded to provide guidance and feedback so that the practical business um, of providing early language and literacy skills and opportunities to communities are not lost amongst all these competing priorities. As you go about your thinking and discussions today, keep practical plans for early years, oral language and literacy development top of mind, as you did by producing the proposed national early year strategy. Keep that practical focus on how quality language and literacy development can be built with and not for communities to create informed communities who are skilled at supporting strong growth in children's early language and literacy. 
And may I contribute today with two practical considerations. Today is the first day of Harmony Week. Over half of all Australians are born overseas or have at least one parent who is born overseas. They, along with First Nations Australians, cherish their home language and literacy. Sharing language and literacy through stories and songs promotes inclusiveness, respect and belonging, which in turn is a protective factor for healthy children and adults. And again, as I mentioned, closing the gap on health involves closing the education gap. Shared language and literacy experiences in the very early years through authentic engagement with quality home language and English language learning experiences build strong communities and strong children. Now I've heard on countless occasions that families wish their children to be strong and capable in both English and in their home language. And this group here today needs to ensure that home languages, which includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, are included in the early years strategy uh, backed by clear guidelines as to how this work will be funded and rolled out from the urban to very remote early years learning sites. In my view, attendance and engagement with families will grow and children will have a stronger pathway to English language and literacy uh, skills and a stronger educational journey, promoting stronger health and well-being too. Now this segues neatly into my next key practical consideration. It is positive engagement with digital opportunities that enhance children's learning growth. As co-chair of the Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation and chair of the Living First Language platform, I oversee three of their digital products, which are examples of harnessing the best of what new technology offers for children's growth and community involvement. For example, the Living First Language platform. It's a global scalable digital platform that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are using to rapidly and collectively record, curate, explore and share their language as vibrant, living, teaching and learning resources. Secondly, the Feed the Monster app. It is an early literacy game in first languages. The Waramungu version is soon to be available uh, from your preferred app store. And third is the Early Language and Literacy Development Index, or ELDI, as we call it. That is the digital formative assessment with um, a world unique progression scale uh, for two to eight year olds. And Mary Ruth, I'm sure, will cover this in, in the next session. At the moment, it is in English, but has the digital architecture to be replicated in home languages as well. Now, these are three examples of utilising uh, the exceptional opportunities that quality digital technology uh, designs open up for quality education opportunities. The ability to view and hear and interact with the content is so enriching. Children can hear their own community members pronouncing words correctly as they listen to a story or sing a song, which can be shared from one site to another, uh, building a rich resource of quality local, locally sourced multi-sensory languages uh, and literacy learning experiences. Now, I can definitely tell you that communities want more than the jingle, head, shoulders, knees and toes in home language. Now, this Thursday, a wonderful event will be held here in Canberra at the National Library of Australia. It showcases what I've just described. The event is the launch uh, presented by the Papula Apari um, Kari Aboriginal Corporation, or PAC as we call it, a language centre in Tennant Creek in partnership with the ALNF. The launch represents a significant milestone in a 19 year collaboration between PAC and ALNF and will highlight the innovations made possible by the award winning Living First Language platform. And I say award winning because we've, we've uh, picked up six global awards for this app um, over the, uh, the years preceding COVID. Um, and uh, the South by Southwest, which is now going to be held in Sydney later in the year, was one of the big events that we were recognised um, for the app. On the day, ALNF and PAC will unveil a comprehensive Waramungu language space on the platform, along with the Waramungu version of the Feed the Monster. Um, Arangi, Yukur, Nuka, Yunta, it's called. The platform and the practical learning resources that flow from it 
are an example of the type of practical tools Australia needs for sharing quality home languages and literacy experiences across the geographic divide. Invitations to this launch are on the front table, on the tables over there, uh, but you'll also receive um, uh, through the chat box uh, uh, an invitation. Uh, so that's going to happen on Thursday at noon, just down the road here. Now, as the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition, your expertise is wide ranging and represents long-standing experiences in language and literary services that support communities and children. Now, I thank you for asking me to open today and, uh, and share a few thoughts with you and, and to progress a very important conversation. And I wish you a very productive day. I know that, um, you know, that we've, uh, all, we all know what's, what's required. It's our job now to be able to convince the bureaucrats, the ministers, um, uh, on, on what's necessary, but also convince them that, that if we want to lift our global rankings, if we want to be able to achieve, um, you know, the NAPLAN or whatever other tests that they want us to, uh, to achieve in, as, as we progress through schooling, the investment has to happen in early years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that really comprehensive overview of, of the, the issues and the concerns that we, we all share, but also for offering some really valuable um, insights and contributions in terms of some solutions. So we really appreciate that. And much of what you've spoken about aligns um, so well with, with the, the key priorities and, and the key objectives of the proposed um, strategy under the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition. So thank you. That was a fantastic opening to our day. Um, we are now moving into our National Early Years Summit uh, panel, and I invite speakers to come to the floor. We've got a table up here for you to join us. So Sam Page, um, Mary, Mary Ruth and Penny, come forward. And just while you're, you're getting yourselves comfortable, um, uh, as most of you know, as we've discussed already, um, the Australian government is currently developing the National Early Years Strategy to shape its vision for the future of children and their families. The coalition is very pleased that the government is recognising how crucial the early years are for children's development and as a basis for their life trajectory. We're certainly supportive of the government's aim to create a more integrated, holistic approach to support education, well-being, and development. And again, it closely reflects our approach and the aims of the proposed National Early Language and Literacy Strategy. We're very fortunate that several members of our coalition are represented on the advisory panel for the Early Years Strategy, including Sam Page from Early Childhood Australia, Penny Dakin from ERACI, and Professor Sharon Goldfeld from Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And, and um, Professor Goldfeld was not able to join us today. Um, as many will know, the government recently hosted the National Early Years Summit at Parliament House on the 17th of February. And the summit brought together parents, community organisations, peak bodies and representatives from across government, non-government, academic and business sectors to discuss the development of the early years strategy. And again, uh, on, on the day, our coalition was well represented. Uh, in addition to those already mentioned, um, my organisation, Speech Pathology Australia, uh, was represented by our president, Tim Kittle, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today. Um, and I know that there were other representatives of the Australian Numeracy and Literacy Foundation there, the Smith family, Raising Literacy Australia, um, and um, others that, that I've mentioned. And I expect that there's probably many here in the room and, and online also who may have been at that summit. Um, it was a really important and worthwhile um, uh, opportunity for us all to contribute our insights. So in this session um, today, we're going to hear from three of the summit participants on their reflections on the summit and discuss how they envisage early language and literacy might fit into the bigger picture of uh, forming a national early years strategy. So I'm going to introduce each of our panel members 
Um, firstly, I'll introduce um, Sam Page from Early Childhood Australia. Thanks, Sam. Uh, as the CEO of Early Childhood Australia, Sam advocates for policies and programs that will ensure that every young child has the opportunity to thrive and learn. ECA um, is the National Peak, uh, Peak Early Childhood Advocacy Organisation, acting in the interests of young children, their families, and those in the early childhood field. ECA advocates to ensure quality, social justice, and equity in all issues relating to the education and care of children aged birth to eight years. ECA also delivers professional support to the early childhood education and care sector uh, through highly regarded publications, events, and projects. So welcome, Sam. Secondly, um, Mary Ruth Mendel is from the uh, Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation, as we've mentioned before. Mary Ruth has a very distinguished career as a speech and language pathologist, so I'm particularly you know, pleased that Mary Ruth's on the panel today. Um, over the past 40 plus years, I think we probably sort of are fairly aligned with how long we've been in the profession. Um, and Mary Ruth's certainly been um, very key in implementing and, and pioneering clinical practice that has earned wide respect. This cutting edge thought leadership led to the formation of the Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation, ALNF, in 1999, through and through the historic addition of the foundation into the Tax Act of Australia to make it the first literacy and numeracy charity in Australia. The ALNF believes that all people have the right to language and literacy, reinforcing that being able to speak, listen, read, write and comprehend is the key to accessing information, education and training, employment and participating fully in society. Mary Ruth is the current ALNF, ALNF that's hard to say quickly, co-chair along with, as we said before, Professor Tom Karma. And Mary Ruth is the executive director of the ALNF specialised programs, which provide training, support and resources to address the diverse needs of individuals, families and communities across remote and urban Australia, specifically supporting Indigenous, refugee and disadvantaged Australians. And as Tom has mentioned, over the past 20 years, the scope of ALNF's work has expanded to harness the latest technology to provide digital solutions, including development of an online early language and literacy index, the LD, and the Living First Language platform, as uh, Tom outlined for us. Mary Ruth is often quoted with, language and literacy is the vital multiplier, building capacity for individuals, families, communities, and nations. So welcome, Mary Ruth, to the panel. And thirdly, but not, not least, um, Penny Dakin is the CEO of ERACI. Thank you, Penny, for joining us. We know that you've just come across from the, the big Parliament House over the hill and, and down to us. So we uh, appreciate that you've had other commitments today, but you've been able to, to join us right on time. Thank you. So Penny is the CEO of ERACI, the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, having commenced in this role in mid-2018. Previously, Penny held senior roles in organisations, including the Australian Government, Department of Health, um, and with Insight Consulting and A Village for Every Child. Penny's solid grounding in public health informs her approach to child wellbeing and systems transformation. Penny's an invited representative on key leadership and policy committees across sectors and was part of the inaugural Social Impact Leadership Australian cohort. And since Penny's appointment as CEO, CEO at ERACI, um, ERACI's grown in its mission to bring people and knowledge together and create systemic change for children. Penny's deep connections across sectors and ability to forge powerful collaborations have seen ERACI deliver major achievements including the 500 Delegate National Early Years Summit back in March 2020. Gosh, was that in person? That was, must have been just, just snuck in. <laughs> just snuck in in time. Um, and also the subsequent formation of the Cross-Sector Early Years Catalyzing Group, amongst many other um, key initiatives. 
And alongside other key partnering organisations um, of the co coalition, ARACI has taken a lead role in supporting the work of, of the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition through managing the Ian Potter grant process on behalf of, of, of the coalition as a whole. So welcome, Pat, um, welcome Penny. So long introductions to everybody, but um, you can see the tremendous amount of, of work and significant achievements each of our panel members have made. So we're, we're very keen to hear our panel, panel members' views and reflections on the recent summit, having each attended there quite recently, and, and to talk of your, um, I guess, key learnings and, and some of the, the key themes that came out of it, but particularly sort of lessons and suggestions that as a coalition and as other people working in the field um, might like to um, consider. I've got some prompt questions, uh, which I'll ask and, and ask each of you to, to comment on, but you know, feel free to jump in at, at any time as well. Um, and then we will have an opportunity for questions from, from the group. And I'm not sure how we're going to manage questions online, but, um, um, or we, if, if we can do that, that's great. Yep, we've got some nods, um, but also um, we'll be able to, to answer some of the questions that might come through the chat online at a later time if we can't get to everything. So very broadly, um, and I might, I'll start with you, um, Penny, at, at this stage, but the same question for each of you. What were your reflections on the summit and were there themes from the day which particularly resonated with you, especially if you feel they offered some clear links to children's early development? There we go. Uh, thank you. Great question. Um, I think one of the really interesting things for me about this year's Early Year Summit, because I, I note that in your introduction for, for me, you spoke about the National Early Year Summit back in 2020, which was very, very close to the wire with COVID. And um, I think one of the wonderful things about the, the day on the 17th of February when many of us and, and, and many, many other people were gathered at Parliament House was that it was a very eclectic group. Um, there were people who would not normally see the work that they do as being at all connected to the early years or very, very peripherally. Um, connected to the early years. Um, I um, spent my day sitting um, between Fiona Nash and um, Sam Mostyn, who both do amazing, make amazing contributions to the life of issues around gender and education, um, but not so much in the, the space of, of, a, of a broader understanding of the early years and the, the vast depth of, of things that contribute to a really high quality experience of the early years for a child who's born in Australia. And I, I loved the fact that we spent the day trying to understand each other's perspectives and understand, understand the complexities of all of those things around early childhood development and the role that that plays. And we spoke a little bit about, you know, what type of society do we want to be? What type of nation is this and how can we ground our approach to the way we view our earliest years of life in the context of what type of society do we want to be so we spoke a lot about equity we spoke a lot about trust how do we reconfigure our um, approach to not only early years but all things um, where the government or the for purpose sector interact with communities to, to ground that in trust as opposed to accountability. And what I loved about that conversation was it took the early years beyond just a very standalone issue and it really embedded it in, in the bigger conversations about the fabric of society, who we are, who we want to be and how we can help um, take our younger citizens on a journey that allows them to be part of that, but also to contribute with their own sort of understanding of what type of community they want to be a part of and what society, part of society they want to be a part of. And I think one of the, the things that I think about when I reflect on that is I spent a lot of time um, chatting with Emma Watkins um, about um, what this means for children with a disability and how we think about the acquisition of language and literacy for a child with a disability, for a child from multicultural background with a disability, for a child who's living by choice 
and by desire and connection to country in a remote part of the country as, a, as, a, as an Aboriginal person? And how do we think about early language and literacy in the context of the life experiences of those people? And then how does that enable them to be part of those bigger discussions about the type of country we want to be and the type of society we want to be? And it's not usual to go to a national forum and have those types of high quality conversations. So I think um, as I reflect on, on what I got out of the summit and And, you know, the power of what are highly important issues like language and literacy, we also think about those bigger picture issues about who we are as a country and, and how we get and how we allow children to shape that into the future. Thanks, Penny. And over to Sam um, for the same question, your reflections on the summit, in particular yeah. comment, you know, themes and, and uh, highlights for you. Thank you. Uh, look, it would be really easy. I um, worked out that I've been working in Canberra just over 20 years now. It makes me feel very old. Uh, but it would be really easy to be cynical. Right? How many strategies, inquiries, reviews, reports, how many processes have we been through for the, over the last 20 years? It would be really easy um, to feel a bit jaded by all of that work and, um, and question whether you know, we're going to get some value out of another summit and a new strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, I don't feel jaded or cynical at all. I feel incredibly optimistic. Um, and I do feel like this is perhaps the first time that early childhood experts and advocates and people who've been talking about these issues for a really long time are being invited by government into uh, the policy making um, Intent, if I can put it that way, and, and actually actively listen to. And while I, um, you know, felt extraordinary pleased to see the diversity of the people that were at the summit and participating and all the people on the panels, so many leaders from across um, so many different parts of our sector and other sectors. Um, I do think it's probably the first time we're all in the room together uh, and that we got to, uh, you know, really uh, listen to each other from Fiona Stanley early in the morning talking about how do we make children's well-being as important as uh, GDP in this country? How do we measure it? Um, from the ministers, Minister Rishworth and Minister Ali saying they really are um, looking for big, bold um, ideas and, and innovation. Um, and uh, uh, Tom, it's just so lovely um, to have you here today and to listen to you this morning. You won't remember, but I came to you, I think it would have been about 2006, um, seeking uh, some help uh, to develop a reconciliation action plan for the very first time and feeling very white and very much um, my English ancestry, which meant I had experienced very little um, Australian history uh, and I felt uh, very uncomfortable at being given the job of drafting a reconciliation action plan and not really understanding what that whole process was like. And you were incredibly generous to me and incredibly wise um, um, in your guidance and and I learned an awful lot about reconciliation but I also felt um, that I had a part to play uh, in reconciliation in this in this nation and I've, I, I I hope you know um, that that you know I've lived that ever since uh, and felt a real responsibility for that and I feel that this is our opportunity in the early years in a similar way to take a shared responsibility and to share power in this space. There was a lot of discussion at the earlier summit about um, centering and respecting and valuing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and language and culture. Uh, and I think it's, it's so important that um, you have reminded us this morning, often when we talk about literacy, we're really talking about English literacy uh, rather than uh, the, the multi-linguistic capabilities that we have um, in children across this country. And we really need to embrace that. Uh, and there was um, recognition of that at the summit. There was also recognition that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations are showing us the way when it comes to uh, community led place based integrated service delivery. And we have a lot to learn uh, from those models uh, that could be could be picked up and applied um, across other 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 um, parts of the sector. Um, I too sat at a table with a GP, a preschool director, speech pathologist, um, the uh, head of the Parenting Research Centre, 
a really diverse um, mix. And in our conversations, I think we surfaced some of the really significant tensions in this space from a policy perspective. We can talk about strength-based and move into deficit language very quickly. We're not very good at holding ourselves to the principle of strengths-based. We can also set up a false dichotomy between place-based and universal. Actually, we need both of those things. To say a child needs access to preschool in every community, wherever they are, regardless of their household income, is a really important policy objective. It doesn't mean that the preschool will look exactly the same in each community where it's delivered. It won't. It will need to be, it will need to look differently, be run by different people, be staffed by different people, operate under different conditions. Universal and and um, and place-based can coexist. Um, similarly, we might need some targeted strategies to support engagement or to lift outcomes uh, for some cohorts of children, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to build a, um, a, a second stream of service delivery. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, Silvana yes. spoke about service systems as, as highways and roads and like the NDIS superhighway versus the back country road that family um, centred uh, support looks like. And I think that's an incredibly good analogy. Let's all, you know, try and um, build safe roads uh, that we can all travel on. Um, and similarly, I think there can be a tension between individual and family centred approaches uh, and professional evidence based uh, uh, interventions or I don't like the word interventions, but um, support and services and we haven't got the balance quite right, we particularly haven't got the balance quite right for children with developmental concerns or disability in the very early years and we spoke a lot about that. The fact that the summit in one day surfaced those significant areas of tension um, and um, important areas for policy was, was very uh, reassuring and um, quite inspiring, actually. I'm looking forward to um, where the early years strategy uh, comes on some, of these, on some of these important topics. Thank you, Sam. And Mary Ruth, your reflections as well, please, your thoughts. It really was a very, very, and um, I've just painted a picture for you. We were in the main foyer, um, which was closed off. Um, and there were round tables with about 10 at each round table. And so the room was full of, you know, a couple of hundred people. Can I check passionate that Mary Ruth's microphone's on? Are you hearing down the back there? Yes, great, thank you. Passionate people who were um, sitting at these round tables. So we had five ministers there uh, at the beginning and uh, Ministers Rishworth and Ali stayed the whole day, as did their staff, and circulated around and took a really active role in talking and listening and asking questions um, of the different tables. Importantly, at each table, there was a moderator whose job it was to kind of gather information and corral it, we had sticky notes where she kept bringing it back to how would that look from a policy perspective? What words would you want to see written into a policy? And we had a scribe who sat there and who typed out all of uh, the conversations and took notes of the people at the tables. That all in real time was going back to um, a couple of people who were receiving that information and collating it and coming back and asking clarifying questions if there was something that they didn't quite come through clearly for them. So it wasn't just that we all had, as Sam and Penny are saying, these robust conversations. There was actually a process for collecting the ideas and at the tables clarifying and narrowing down and getting to the pointy end of what it is that the people at the table really did want to see. So here was what we were upset about, here is what we wanted, but then what are we going to do really? Like what is the possibility of what we're going to do? So around my table, there was somebody from the Productivity Commission who was incredibly energetic in the conversations. There was Silvana who talked about who, who, is, um, who represents people, families living with a child with a disability and how that superhighway just becomes um, so impersonal. 
Um, there was uh, there was a parent of two year old twin girls who is a really kind of famous Sean um, Zepps, and uh, he's a famous podcaster on parenting. And he was really questioning the way that information goes out to parents, to families. How are we connecting? And, and kind of, I'm, I'm kind of bringing what he's saying down too narrowly. And he said it in a really uh, sophisticated way. But he was saying, in essence, websites are too clunky. There's no way to access the information that's really enriching, that we can do better than that. And we can get into, and of course, he's an example of podcasting, but conversations with parents and we, that are through digital opportunities. He also said things like, because he's got two-year-olds, he's right in the mix at the moment of working you know going to preschool and enrolling and he said all the forms are too old and it's like made me think back and it's like he was giving examples of what the forms what's on the forms to enroll some of the content marginalizes people from feeling that they're they're included and that they're welcome as a family into that space or it's just oldie worldie or it just and it just is too literacy heavy for people to feel that they're not going to be unmasked and shamed if they can't fill in a basic form about themselves and their kitty. So there was those kinds of types of conversations. Sitting next to me was the lady from Breastfeeding Australia, who was incredibly interesting about what their objectives are for the very newborn baby and how breastfeeding is so important for connection and breastfeeding is so important and talked about the research around those very, very early days when bubbers are just connecting. And of course, I was able to jump in as, as a speechy and say, and they're listening to speech sounds of their mum and they're working out the difference between human speech and environmental sounds. It's all part of the story. So we then had people who represented um, the types of community get together places that we need. And words came out that are, we've heard them before, but they're like family and community hubs is a general way to put it. Places where everyone can go. So they're a preschool or a early learning site, but they're also can I say like wraparound services was used a lot, those terms and, um, and uh, being able to do like one stop shopping. But they were talking about being able to have um, at these family centres uh, also washing machines so that people who need to access uh, washing machines can do so that there's, there's you know, bathtubs for kiddies to have a bath if they need that. Um, and there's places for mums to, and, and dads to, to have a coffee and to talk about, you know, life in general, whilst there's the early learning site going about working with children as, as you know, we all would like to see that happening, um, you know, following a bit of a curriculum and making sure there's quality engagement for children. So all of that was just on our table. And then at various times during the day, people would stand up and they'd give the feedback from their table. Um, and so we got to hear not just the rich conversations that were happening at our own tables, but we got to hear the summaries of the other tables as well. And I would concur that there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and knowledge in the room. I think one thing I would like to put out there though, was is that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander early childhood strategy was put together in about 2021, I think. Um, and it is a wonderful document. That document was funded and worked on for a couple of years. And you can see a copy of that on the SNAIC website that's S-N-A-I-C-C -C, on their website. Now that work was done in, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, but really was is a template for all children. 
If you'd like to go on it and have a look at that quality document, it was acknowledged on the day of the summit that yes, that document is, is, a, is a catalyst for thinking for the early years summit and for the early years um, strategy that will flow from it. And I'd just like to acknowledge that that work, that amazing body of work has been done by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group that met and worked very hard. And it is a quality document we should all turn to as a yardstick for how we can look at a national strategy. In the room as well was Connected Beginnings, um, which as you know, is the funded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander program by the government. And the lady was representing Tasmania um, was there. She talked about uh, how Connected Beginnings in Tasmania is working and how the connectedness part of it is working um, and how non-Indigenous families are finding joining in is so nourishing and welcoming and inclusive and how, how they're finding that they really are becoming a community organisation for all children and all families. And I do want to put that out there because there is a blueprint as well of something that's working now that we can all look at and say it has a value for multicultural Australia, as Tom said in Harmony Week. There's many home languages around, there's many families of different varieties, and they're finding that they've, they're actually um, becoming very active in all the different communities, and it's a good, and it's a good uh, blueprint for us to look at. Minister Ali did come around to the various tables and she sat for a long time at our table and she talked about data. And I have to say it's one of the few times that I've heard that word used in the early years with the early years sector. Mostly we're talking about um, the AEDC and reflecting on children, whether they have achieved or not achieved. And when I was talking to Minister Ali about data, she said, we need data so that we can plan better. I said, in the oral language and early literacy space, we need data so that we can really workshop with educators and families how to best support their children for, and I think we need to change the dialogue, not for data to know if we have succeed or not, or not succeeded with children, but for data that tells about children's growth journey and how what we're doing as families, how what we're doing as educators is enriching that child's growth journey. So a kitty might be a really high flyer and be up here and their growth journey's going whiz bang. Another child might have peaks and troughs. If we have visibility over that child's growth journey and it's not judgmental, it's their growth journey. We know as grown-ups around the children how we can support children to make the most of all the opportunities in their everyday activities, in their early learning sites, with their families, with home language and with English. And I think that data, data story needs a lot more discussion to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of have children grown, yes or no? Have we got a deficit model? And, and, and what Sam's talking about, a strength-based model, really, if you have a start changing the narrative around children and their development to their growth story, then we're starting to celebrate each child and where they are up to and where their journey is taking them. It kind of would be nice to get away from school readiness into growth journeys towards schools and having schools ready to greet children where they are in their growth journey, rather than whether the child is ready or not to go to school, because they're just little tackers. It's up to us to make sure that they've got the best and strongest growth journey. So Minister Ali also asked about collecting data in home languages and how we could have more visibility over children's growth journey in their home languages and in English, recognising, as Sam said, that most schools are in English um, and their teachers speak in English, but that's not necessarily the strength of the children as they're transitioning from their early years and stepping into school. 
So we had that conversation with Minister Ali, who sat for a very long time and was really engaged with all of that. And many people had um, um, opinions of that, but everybody agreed that it needed to be a growth journey and we need to change the narrative about how we think about children's and talking about children's development. So on the whole, I'd like to finish up by talking about a story that Catherine Little, who's the CEO of Snake. So there were panels on the day and uh, they sat up on the dais and people uh, talked about their perspective on early childhood. Catherine told a story She's the CEO of Snake, um, and she could have said many things. And I won't retell her story, it's her story, but I will give you a thumbnail sketch because it, it was a very valuable story for the room. The story was of her and her grandmother coming back from a, very, a meeting in a very remote place in Central Australia on a, in a car on their own, driving along. And behind them, they became aware of like a tornado, a big atmospheric change. And it was swirling behind them, coming down the road and coming closer and closer and closer to them. It changed the atmosphere in the air. It changed the clouds became darker. The intensity that she was feeling became like, wow, what's happening? What's going on? Even the geography started to change as the sand swept around. And she was able to give to us this incredible sense of intensity, in fact, needing comfort from her grandmother as she drove and the sense of I have to get to somewhere safe. And she left that story sitting there in the room. It was a very important story because I want us all to reflect on what trauma can do to children. She felt like she had to get to that safe space. The focus was on being in that safe space. She couldn't think about anything else around because she had to get to that safe space. And it really made me reflect what we need to do, like Tom says, health, well-being, and education. We have to make children that sure that the children are in a safe space and so are the families so that we, don't, we can actually nurture and have that growth journey. And I thought it was a very beautiful way and I wanted to contribute that today because it's the reality of so many children and families um, that they don't feel that they're in a safe space and that when they go into a place like an early learning site, perhaps that has to be one of our first priorities. And when we think that what Sean was saying, that even the forms make people feel othered when they go to enrol their children, we, we might really need to sit back and think about the safe space and welcoming space. Thank so, you, Mary yeah. Ruth. Yeah, thank you. That was a, a really yeah, powerful story and, and a really interesting reflection to, to, um, for us all to think about in terms of children needing those safe spaces. I know Kieran's going to give me a little wind up, I think, no? Um, <laughs> I'm going to collapse the, I had two more questions for each of the panel members, but I'm going to collapse them a little bit. Um, we've still got a little bit of time, but I was hoping to give um, the audience the opportunity to ask questions too. But so maybe um, perhaps just, um, you've all given such sort of rich conversations around your experiences at the summit. And I think for, for all of us, we're really looking forward to some positive outcomes. So I'm just wondering if you could um, reflect briefly in terms of what do you think might be the next steps in terms of the, the future consultations? We know there's further consultations occurring, um, but also particularly um, sort of following on from that summit, um, what might be your suggestions for how the coalition and other organisations progress our aim? And yes, particularly around early language and literacy, but we know that as, as I think you particularly said, Penny, that this is part of a bigger picture. We have to acknowledge that it's part of a bigger picture around child development um, and the needs of, of um, children and families in society. But just bringing it back to the coalition, what, what advice do you have for us? Yeah, look, I, the ministers have been very honest. They've been very um, at pains to point out that this is the start of their conversation and the summit, whilst it was an amazing event and all of the, the reflections from the panel are, are, are true, um, 
but they are also um, they've come to it with a very um, open, collaborative focus. They are, they recognise that they hold some wisdom, and that the expert advisory panel that Sam and I sit on holds another set of wisdoms, and that the people who are at the summit yet a broader set of wisdoms, but beyond that, there is an incredible depth of knowledge and understanding about early childhood experiences that reflect the multiple journeys that various families and, and, and people go through. And so they want to gather as much of those stories, as many of those stories as possible. They want to create a very fulsome picture of what it is like to, to experience the early years in Australia, both as a child and as a parent and as a provider of services and all of the other things. And so they are encouraging people to be part of this consultation process. I think the government themselves are running round tables, but they are also encouraging people who are interested in hearing from their own constituencies to run round tables and discussions and to feed them in through the submission process that the, the government have got going. I know a race is planning to do a few. I know many of our partners are, are planning to do either more or additional consultations, um, because that depth of story, you know, as, as Mary Ruth and Catherine's story shows is that when we tell the stories of the people on the ground, we get the best pictures of what we need to do. So I guess from the coalition's perspective, I would say, let's gather our stories, let's tell our stories in meaningful ways through the voices of our members, through the voices of our constituents, whatever they, they might look like, and then feed those through into the process, be a part of other processes. And the other, my other advice would be to think about um, the broader context. So the early year strategy is just one element of a major reform agenda by a new government. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm tired. These guys have been doing a huge amount of work in the last 10 months and the early years is just one aspect of it, but they are coming at it with a very joined up approach. They're trying to make these things, whether it be early years, whether it be measuring what matters, measure, whether it be whatever else that they've done, they're trying to make them connect. So our job as a coalition will be to try and make our issues fit into not only the early years agenda, but the wider agenda of the government as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam? Yes, look, I think, I think the early years strategy gives us an opportunity finally to bring all the work that we've been doing for the, the some years now, I'm looking to Kieran, where, since we were um, first at that um, language and literacy uh, summit back in 2016 or 2017. One of the difficulties for the uh, work that we've done and the strategy proposal that we've developed is where it sits, who's responsible for it? What is the governance mechanism that would give life to that strategy? Who would adopt and champion that strategy within government? We've not landed that bit. I think the early years strategy is an opportunity to re-prosecute language and literacy development as a potentially as a you know primary outcome area of mm -hmm. the early years strategy, if I can go that far. Um, and then talk about what is that governance, what would that governance structure look like? Uh, how would we line up uh, the role of libraries and play groups and community organisations and early childhood education and care uh, in terms of the development of, of language and literacy in the early years? And how could that be part of the strategy? And I think where the complexity of that is you either get very, very high level and very boring Right. This is a this is backed by a piece of legislation that says the well-being and development of children must be considered in the budget, must be considered in each piece of legislation that comes through the parliament, must be considered in major policy development in every government portfolio. That sounds really boring, but it would actually transform the way we do um, parliamentary work in Australia. We've never done that before, right? So that would that would actually be quite powerful. Um, or we get to the, or we, or we have in the strategy, this is an area of outcome. And here is how that is that next layer of work. How does that get progressed in education? How does that get progressed in health? How does that get progressed in social and community services? Um, is going to have to be done by us. Let's get real. Like it is, it is this coalition of people here in the room that is going to add that level of detail to the strategy if, if, we, can, um, if we can convince uh, the ministers, the relevant ministers, to include this as a, as a primary objective of the earlier strategy, and I hope that they do. Thank you. And Mary Ruth, just some closing thoughts on that too, please. Um, just quickly, uh, I think what Leslie Lobel contributed is really relevant at this point. 
and that is the timing. Uh, she feels that uh, Medicare and the rollout of the NDIS are blueprints that uh, could help us make sure that we have something that is actioned within the next three years so that we don't go into another election cycle where it's all carried over. And, and uh, so that timing is important, not just the what and the how, but the timing. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's great reflections from, from all of you. And I'm just thinking, Alexis, you must be taking lots of notes. <laughs> And wonderful, I'm sure, from your perspective to hear how positive everyone um, has been about the summit, which is great. I think there are, I think you're you're very right that there's lots of opportunities for us. And this is really a, a sort of stepping stone, a platform on which we can build. I'm wondering, well, okay, Kieran's just told me we've got five minutes. So some burning questions from the floor or online for our panel members. No, everyone's wanting morning tea. More scones. So, would be um, poor of us as advisory group members not to mention that submissions are currently open um, and that the summary document from the summit was released just the other day. So it is, right. is now available and submissions are open. But I think the real work is going to start in the next phase in terms of what the solutions might be. Yeah, and as you said, there's a lot of round tables that are occurring as well that's going to contribute further to that discussion. I would just add to that. I, some, the submissions are really valuable. And so I think if we have a perspective, it's really important that we all pair them and put them put them in submissions. But the, the, the hard work of this work, and I look at Alexis because we've had this conversation, is actually... Um, the synthesis of that. So there's lots of great ideas. There's lots of multiple priority areas. The difficult work will be to make sure um, that we take what we know, because we know lots, and turn it into things that we can actually do, things that will actually positive steps forward that we can take to get to the outcomes we want to achieve. Uh, and as my uh, colleague, uh, Michael in Queensland comments, makes a, you know, says a lot, um, we don't have a knowing problem, we actually have a doing problem. So let's make sure that the things that we put on paper, we're able to translate into doing into things that we can actually do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, we, we have very complex solutions. I remember being up at Parliament House a few years ago and a then opposition um, representative said she had the solution, a speech therapist in every school and every early childhood centre. And I remember just looking at her thinking, you're mad. Like there aren't enough speech therapists in the world, probably <laughs> to have one full time allocated it, to it every school. It is our school. dream as well. well <laughs> <laughs> but the, but but the, the, the but to but to try and help her understand the actual complexity of supporting improvements in language and literacy would is a much longer conversation. Do you know what I mean? Like that proposal gains ground because it sounds so simple and it sounds so electable. It sounds it's got real attraction to it, right? But it's it doesn't actually it, it, it sort of negates all the hard work that this coalition has done with this early, years, this early language and literacy um, strategy over all of these years. And so that's what we're competing against, folks. That's yeah. what we have to, we have to start making the complexity of the responses that we have easy to understand, easy to implement, um, and, and easy to put into a bite-sized media release. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. It's, it's very much multifaceted. Um, and, you know, there are particular um, you know, solutions, if you like, that we might wish to propose, but it needs to be, um, it needs to be in the broad context and it needs to be integrated. There's lots of things that can happen, but we know that they are happening in different spaces. What we haven't got is that national coordination. So, so yes, I'd like a speech in every childhood um, education centre. Um, but there's lots of other things that need to happen as well and it all needs to be integrated and it's all part of providing a, a holistic service to children and families but in that bigger context of everyone's life as well is there any tom please thank you for that feedback i think it was tremendous on on the summit 
which I forgot to mention in my, my speech, but um, uh, it, it was very good, Mary Ruth told me at the time. Um, two things I wanted to reflect on. One is the people who we are targeting today will be at the right sort of age and have the right capacity to be able to be submariners on the Orca submarines. <laughs> That's how long we're, we're looking into the future, um, you know, 2050 plus. Uh, the other is that, uh, just a reminder that, that um, the Reconciliation Australia has wraps with close to 5,000 early childhood centres and, and, um, and schools. So that'd be a useful group to, to be able to, um, uh, to interface with in, in this uh, uh, development. Thank you. Any other questions or final comments before we wrap up? And I actually just the, gloat because early childhood services outstrip schools with the number of reconciliation action plans they have <laughs> with Narragunnawally. And I think that's an incredible achievement for Reconciliation Australia and the Narragunnawally team. Um, but I absolutely agree in the embracing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages that has come out of that process is fantastic. And I can't wait to tweet your three resources, Tom, that you mentioned, because I know people will be keen to, to pick those up and use those. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. Are there any questions from the online people? No? Okay. All right. Well, I think um, that's been just a, a, an amazing conversation. So I really would like to thank the three of you. Um, I would have liked to have been a, a fly on the wall at the summit as well, but only one representative from the different organisations were able to be there. Um, but I think it's, it's obviously been a very uh, rich conversation. And as I said before, Pat, most likely just the start of a lot of further discussions. And I think how we can all be involved in that, that conversation and shape the conversation, I think is a really important message for us. So thank you very much for all, all three panel members. We are now going to just um, break for some further refreshments, just briefly, I think 15 minutes, uh, and then we're going to come back to a series of uh, four presentations of um, some really interesting and, and, and um, uh, fantastic initiatives. Um, Kieran's going to be introducing those presentations and halfway through, so we'll have two, then we're gonna have a lunch. We are giving you lots of food and refreshments, that's good. And then there'll be another two and then we'll be winding up for the day. Thank you. Good morning, tea's just outside. Welcome back uh, from the break. Uh, for the, those of you who don't know me, my name's Kieran Sampson. I'm currently working with ERACI on a couple of projects, including uh, this event today with my excellent colleague, colleague Liz Deepers, who is the captain of the Zoom ship today. Um, but I have worked uh, with the coalition for many years, um, big, as I, I previously worked for ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association, the peak body for libraries. And as mentioned a couple of times today, this coalition evolved out of an event uh, that we ran in 2016. So uh, this, this area, uh, as a, someone who also has a, an educated background is pretty close to my heart. Um, I get frustrated that we uh, wring our hands about NAPLAN scores and PISA rankings and pedagogy and teacher quality when for many children, uh, the issue uh, was something that uh, was caused many years before. Um, today, uh, I've asked four people to speak uh, to tell uh, a bit of a story about uh, what's happening currently in uh, early language and literacy. Um, and uh, our, our four speakers represent um, two areas of potential challenge. And also, I'd like to showcase two successful statewide early literacy programs uh, that are, have been integrated and, and using partnerships um, across the spectrum to achieve positive results. Um, but all perspectives that I hope will give us food for thought. Our first speaker for today um, is Louise Danoon from the State Library of Queensland. Louise is the Executive Director of Public Libraries and Engagement at the State Library. Her background comprises of a number of senior roles in museums and libraries in both Queensland and New South Wales. The State Library works with local government to ensure all Queenslanders have access to deeply local and contemporary library services via a dynamic statewide network of over 320 public libraries and Indigenous Knowledge Centres or IKCs. 
Aside from managing its own programs and functions, the State Library advocates for Queensland public libraries and supports their collections, staff and programs. Today, Louise is here to tell us about First Five Forever, a statewide early literacy program delivered by public uh, libraries and IKCs with the primary aim of providing strong early literacy foundations for all Queensland children aged zero to five. First Five Forever began as a four year $20 million initiative in partnership with local government as part of the Queensland state government's efforts to address concerning AEDC school readiness levels in Queensland. Happily, in 2018, the Queensland government announced ongoing annual funding of $5 million to support the delivery of First Five Forever and to continue the valued role that libraries and IKCs play in supporting early literacy development through their free programs and services. The State Library of Queensland is a member of the National and State Libraries Australasia or NASLA. Um, and they are the peak body for the National, State and Territory Libraries of Australia and New Zealand. And NASLA is one of our coalition members. Please join me in welcoming Louise. Thank you. I love that uh, first session and the sort of informality of it. So uh, please put your hand up, ask questions. What have you wanted to know about First Five Forever? And we can have a conversation because when I was looking at it again last night, I thought, well, what do people really want to know? <laughs> you know, like what's the conversation and the opportunity? Um, so before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders and their continuing connection to land, sea and culture. Um, uh, particularly in Queensland, you know, we've worked very closely with all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities there. And we're honoured to work with people, uh, to have colleagues and uh, in local government, as well as at State Library. And uh, it's very important and meaningful work, as it obviously is for many of you as well. So um, does everyone know what First Five Forever is? <laughs> no. So it is, as uh, Kieran said, so thank you. It's our early literacy program delivered in public libraries. And really it's connecting families to information and resources uh, to meet the, they need to build the best foundation for their child's future language and literacy development. Well, that was the vision before a symposium a couple of last week that uh, both like we talked about with the summit, we brought a whole lot of stakeholders from across Queensland to talk about public libraries and uh, First Five Forever was a real focus and everything sort of back up in the air. So it's, uh, I too will be talking about a conversation that some of you were at, Kathy was there from Alia, but others of you weren't. But I do feel like there is this excitement and momentum building around what, um, around early childhood, children's wellbeing, um, and particularly for what I'll be talking today about the role that public libraries and indigenous knowledge centers can and potentially play uh, in that conversation. So, um, uh, yeah, what have I got here? Uh, so, you know, it's those strong early literacy foundations. It did come out of the AEDC data, uh, the initiative way back eight years ago, and that data was used to make a case and an ambitious uh, Suggestion was made, let's not just ask for 200,000, let's ask for 20 million, and then it came, and then we needed to deliver it. And then there was this enormous momentum, particularly driven by local government and the impact that local government, mayors and councillors could see in their communities. And that is what, um, what maintained it. It's been some interesting conversations about language and certainly First Five Forever has matured. It's about eight years. Some of you would have been there at the beginning when I wasn't. And I know, um, I think Jane Cowell spoke at that symposium in 2016. So, you know, we've been on this journey um, as well. Uh, but certainly that, that thing about language and what to talk about it. But in the end, what we use the most is talk, read, sing, play every day. <laughs> like, how do we get that, uh, those messages out there? So connecting families and promoting the role of parents and really lifting parents up and speaking, um, you know, directly to them. 
So uh, for those of you who don't know much about public libraries, and uh, this is Queensland, but this is all across the country, and Cathy and um, Vanessa can probably tell me how many there are in Queensland, in Australia, but you know, in Queensland, there are more than 320 public libraries, so they're really place-based, deeply local, and that's a partnership uh, with local government. I think the statistic we like to say is there's more than they are, there are McDonald's, and they're in communities as small as 200 people and as large as a million like Brisbane. So, you know, it's that sense of this network, how are we amplifying and leveraging this network that exists? So um, in, in Queensland, and these figures are available for the country, but there's about 300 million invested in public libraries. So how do we leverage that investment? Um, and state library th through the Queensland Go government provides funding for the collections, public library, that's the 26 million there. And there's 5 million for First Five Forever. And I wanted to be able to present this because the 5 million investment relies on the $300 million investment and these wonderful places that exist in Queensland communities. The funding for First Five Forever is, um, okay, it's not there. I, uh, the, the funding for First Five Forever is population-based. So Brisbane gets more than Barcaldon, but we do, uh, wait for the ADC data. So particularly disadvantaged communities, uh, Townsville, Mount Isa got significantly more in the last iteration because we were able Earlier on the panel, we were talking about the universal and as well as the targeted. And certainly that is one of the strengths um, of First Five Forever. So all of the, um, 75 councils that we have partnerships with get funding and deliver First Five Forever in their library service. So Queensland's uh, 5 million people, about 40% are library members. So it's quite a strong reach. Um, and there are 320 place-based locations uh, out there. But who were our superstars? <laughs> like, like all of us, it's actually the people who work there. So there's 1,500 people who work in libraries um, and they're valued for their knowledge and skills. They're respected by communities and they're dedicated to local outcomes. They really are amazing people. First Five Forever uh, has also seen us, uh, the network engaging often people with early childhood expertise coming into the library network um, and seeing how that might be able to be deployed in that way. But certainly a lot of state library support for the uh, First Five Forever is around our work of capability of building this skilled workforce. And it's not, not just the people who do the programs, it's also most councils, all staff in the library service do some version of First Five Forever that, that libraries really are self safe and welcoming places for children and families all of the all the time. So, um, so I think, cause I know someone from uh, TAFE and learning and centers. So I think there is some work that we can do around how are we leveraging each other's uh, capability programs or activities that we're, that we're delivering, that we look at it through a particular library lens, but there are some of those uh, basics and, um, you know, different things we can learn from each other rather than staying in our lane. So First by Forever, um, part of, uh, has been evaluated and looked at in different ways. And what we just launched was the evaluation of 2019 to 2020. That's what, 2022, that's what we launched um, last week. Um, and that uh, summary of those, that report and the outcomes is on, um, on our website if you go looking for it or we can circulate it as well. Uh, Jeff, uh, the University of Southern Queensland, Jeff Wilcock, uh, did some of the, um, did the research and looked at it. So things that um, 
that, that came out, of course, is that it's strength, it's locally based, deeply local, place-based outcomes, whichever way we want to say it, is absolutely key. Um, and that the flexibility and the delivery of the program, what happens in Logan will look different to uh, Thursday Island, and that was a strength rather than a, than a weakness. Um, and that, uh, so other aspects that, so this is, uh, we had an illustrator drawing all of uh, our talks there <laughs> yesterday on um, last week. And so this was the capture of Jeff's presentation uh, on the um, outcomes of the research. So, so it was place-based. The other things were, and I know there are lots of people here, um, about partnerships uh, at that local level. And I think for us, my question is, is what can we do nationally and at a state level to foster the partnerships to ease the way of partnerships at the local level? In some communities, you might have the early years centre here and the library or IKC here and they don't talk to each other. How are we building it in to our work and negotiations uh, that people are talking and working with each other? So, um, what, so partnerships, oh, other one is outreach, how to take, um, uh, how, to, how to go to where children are, children and families, not just relying on them coming into the library. And, and really, uh, most libraries would do that. Uh, and, but Jeff identified that some could do more of that. Um, yeah, and there are regions, uh, I think there, the Northwest region needs more focus and support for, through the reporting and work that he'd identified. So that uh, evaluation was there. Um, what I've done is grabbed a few slides from this amazing presentation that was at the conference from Cairns Library Services. And just because I think it's in the, in the richness of that council's delivery that you see some of the, that, the opportunities. So it certainly is local families, local expertise and local partnerships and, and how that uh, is driven and enacted. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is what it's looking like in Cairns. We actually had a performance from this group and like the description of the moment in the summit, uh, this telling of this incredible story and a truth telling moment, but to, and to children and families and, and uh, being able to welcome them in. And this uh, sense of how we are creating, um, you know, strong, lasting, meaningful relationships and, 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 and what is it that libraries are doing in every place through with partners as well uh, to ensure that that, that gets um, kicked off. And this was, uh, Cairns Library has really been on this extraordinary journey. Um, and this was a quote from one of the... Um, participants, uh, which I think is what we'd all, you know, I felt like I was at home. How are our services as safe and welcoming that people feel comfortable and relaxed to ask questions, to engage with their children and families and to receive those myriad of informations in a positive, affirming way? <laughs> so, First Five Forever is not just about, uh, you know, this is the local implementation, whether it's dirty dinosaur, literally with mud, dads read, whether it's splash and play. I think by, by being so embedded in local government and giving that uh, opportunity for staff in the libraries to actually connect and to feel important about the work that they do. Someone said to me last week from Gympie Library, he said, I know what we do is important, but I've got to come here to, you know, it reinforces the impact that we can have and to connect us with others as well. So this, um, I think this implementation, because I think, um, and many of you were there at that moment, and we've got speech pathologists and neuroscientists here of that sense of the importance of the neuroscience and that message once parents hear it in different ways, um, and, and, and library staff and all of us as people who live in the world, once you start realizing the neuroscience and what's happening in those first five years, 
This was one of our staff members went to Warriba Island, I'll cut Dolly's head off, that's a shame. Um, but the, the, the activity that they did with all of these women from the Torres Strait was they put the, the baby in the middle and then they threw the string around of all the things you do with the baby while we sing this nursery rhyme, we went fishing, we did that. And this wonderful sort of metaphor for neuroscience emerges and that was something that came through the workshop, uh, through the symposium last week is how do we get this bag full of, met, you know, of tools, whether you're using it in a library or an early childhood setting or at a wherever play group, what are the metaphors that we can use that we know resonate and that we can test. So um, I think, you know, once you want, when you're doing things in appropriate way, you know, in culturally appropriate ways in a, in a safe environment, the sort of, uh, the things were flowing on Warriba that day, I think. So uh, just because it was an easier way of sort of summar summarizing this extraordinary um, couple of days we had last week, just thought I'd take you through a couple of the other illustrations. So we were really pleased to have the CEO from the local government association in Queensland, which is quite a powerful entity in, the, in our state. Um, and I do think we should be approaching them to put in a submission to the strategy. Like I think like local government lot and not only libraries, but other things that they're doing, what's their connection and commitment in to the early years, given the role that they play and are so close to communities. But so the CEO of um, LGAQ, she was certainly saying, which I think is something, is the certainty of uncertainty of funding prevents momentum and strategic development. And we know there's fantastic 20 million, but four years, we only got four years, what are we gonna do? And then the money's gonna go and families are gonna be disappointed and our library will look bad. So once that got lifted and it was ongoing, things have been able to flow for all of us, I think, because we're not in such a mechanism. So she uh, was bringing that up in terms of um, this First Five Forever money that LGAQ went to the election as a part of their advocacy campaign. So they feel invested in the outcome that was made. Um, but I think they're just thinking of, because we sort of in such sort of state paradigm and local government, and here I'm in this national forum, but certainly um, Alison from LGAQ mentioned that state and federal and local government election cycles and how does that work? Um, and the diff local government, how do they fit in? But some of my interesting things, but it was that, but, but that acknowledging that, that um, you know, local government gets so such a small fraction of the whole money that's going. <laughs> um, so they do always work through partnerships, um, you know, and that advocacy around that. So how do we build on that? So then um, I don't know if anyone knows Kathy McLeish from Back Roads on ABC. She was our MC for the day. And she pulled together. We had this really high profile panel. So sometimes in libraries, we think people don't know what we do. Well, this panel demonstrated they know exactly what we do um, and they know the importance and our role in that. So we had um, Queensland Council of Social Services, uh, Cameron Costello, First Nations leader in the Queensland, Luke Typhoid, who's the Children's Commissioner, and I'll get back to him because he, we kept coming back to what he provoked us to think about and Heather Ray from Telstra who heads up digital inclusion. So this was um, uh, a way, it wasn't only first five, they were talking more broadly than only early literacy, but we were talking about um, the, that, that central role of libraries. And one of the things that Luke Typhoid said is that they do a huge survey of, live, of kids in, or young people in Queensland every year and all of them, that one of the resounding outcomes is that libraries are safe places, that children identify that libraries are safe places. So hopefully that means that children are safe there as well. But what, you know, I think those things about libraries, about being trusted, about being safe and welcoming and everyone can go is a real um, attribute for us to be able to celebrate and to, to use in that way. Um, 
We were also talking about digital inclusion and really these two bits of research of digital inclusion and first five, they basically overlap and it's the same issues about people who are vulnerable um, with technology, uh, you know, and access uh, are also then finding themselves in libraries and ac accessing early literacy. So there is um, a big bit of research being done by QUT and others um, about low income families and digital inclusion and that mapping really demonstrates where early uh, how families are accessing uh, libraries um, by being welcomed in to do uh, rhyme time or something they then stay and do other things. Um, so the other the other element of what Luke on oh no, I'll end on that yeah. <laughs> So the next day, we had an amazing group that came together to only look at First Five Forever and what our 10 year horizon is for this. And we had uh, early years people there, we had Play Matters, we had a whole Smith family, some of you are all here, who came to help us imagine the future of First Five Forever and the roadmap for the next 10 years. And how do we have that growth mindset. So Michael Hogan from Thriving Queensland Kids and Erasy was there and he he sort of nailed it too to say, well, library, li libraries, uh, I mean, First Five Forever uh, is championing children. So we've said, oh, we increase access to early literacy experiences. Like, yeah, we do, but we're actually championing children, the impact that we can have, the connections that we're able uh, to have. Um, and know that, that ability to be a connector. Um, so again, that's talking about how we would do it. No one size fits all. How do we have um, the channels and building the partnership? So I think things that we've all really um, talked together and how do we work together but don't compete? Um, and I think it is this sort of uh, brand or idea or whatever first five forever is out there that is deeply local but has a statewide you know pitch so how do we pull out the strengths um, of both, all of those so this um luke typhoid and i just keep coming back to it uh the children's commissioner in queensland and you know there's some pretty heavy stuff going on in queensland at the moment but the children's commission has come up with this statement of their vision that every Queensland child is loved, respected and has their rights upheld. It just is so, um, so moving that we would have that uh, aspiration um, or the commission does and what does that mean and I think for all of us who are in the room working with um, children and families and particularly in libraries, it's like, how does that, it's not just access to books and story time, it's actually how you feel cared for, that you feel that there's that empathy that your needs are being catered for and you're being met where you are rather than where, um, you know, where, like the school readiness, that was another point that Luke made. It's like, kids don't need to be school ready, schools need to be kid ready or child ready or, you know, and what does that, that mean for all of us in terms of our thinking. So I think there's been a real maturing of First Five Forever over the last um, eight years, really happy to be able to share those insights and those, um, you know, where, where it might go and, and what we've learned along the way. And I do think it's that, um, it's the sort of the, is it the curse or is it the opportunity of the Federation because state Queensland, funds this, other states don't have, have a different version. I think we're hearing from Kate Ellis later, you know, about what they're doing there. So uh, what does, yeah, how do we overcome that? <laughs> and also how can we uh, position libraries in this way? But, you know, this $5 million investment has come in over or come in on top of this big local government and state government investment as well. And I think it's about leveraging and amplifying and skilling up the network. That Are they all fabulous? Maybe not, but many of them are. And how do we lift each other up? And how do we, um, you know, work together? So I think... Um, <laughs>
questions, conversation. Kathy was at the symposium. Vanessa's here, who's our, uh, the NASLA rep on the, um, the coalition. Um, I might just sort of say that I was at the symposium and it was amazing. Like you go to sort of these <laughs> events and often you just think, oh yeah, I've heard some speakers, but <laughs> it was so well put together and there was a real energy in the room. And I think a lot of that was around um, the speakers and having, it, rather than it wasn't just library people speaking to library people, it was, you know, people from different areas and everyone realising a bit like what people said before on the panel about the early years summit, where it was sort of making those connections and that can be really energizing when you can work out that stuff together. So I suppose my question is, um, you know, who else should we be talking to? I mean, with these stories, um, like you've got from the Cairns Library, mm -hmm. um, the stories about, you know, great things that happen in libraries, for example, um, to do with early language and literacy, who should we be telling those stories to? We'll definitely be throwing them in a submission to the <laughs> early years um, strategy but what other people like I think we've talked about local government um, and having them more involved but um, any view any views I suppose Louise or from anyone else about who else we should be speaking to that we that we haven't been um, I'm, I think the children's commissioner in Queensland and obviously they exist everywhere and that um, that sense of the early years and where where it fits. I think not that we can do everything in this summit, but it was interesting the question kept being raised because first five forever, those kids who've been through are now at primary school. <laughs> We've got an alumni, you know, of uh, children and what are their demands now on library services and how can talk, play, sing, read continue once you've you know, so no, we don't care about you after five, you know, first five, but you're on your own. No, yeah, so how do we think about children uh, and families in libraries once they're out of those years where we have that real intention, um, intention there? So, uh, but that was um, the Children's Commission. I also think that Queensland Council of Social Services and their equivalent as well. Um, you know, Amy's comments and knowledge about how people on very low incomes utilise the full diversity, if they can, of what libraries, uh, you know, have to offer. And I think what's their, uh, you know, hope and aspiration. Uh, in Queensland, it's particularly pointy because we've got the Olympics to look forward to and the legacy of all of that, you know. So what were they looking for and um, obviously homelessness is a big issue everywhere so it's it's not that libraries can do everything or that we even want them to but that they can be key aspects in that delivery um, yeah so I think I mean there's other clever clogs around the room as well about other people to be in the conversation I think the hardest one for us has also been health so early, edu early education, Queensland education, we can kind of have that connection, sometimes connecting with the, the health, except professional associations like the speechy, you know, that's a, a, a more straightforward one, but child and maternal health, how do we get, uh, get them? So we uh, did publish 12 amazing books, which are, uh, um, and now three of them have been made into board books and are going into every babe, you know, into the bounty bag and every baby born in Queensland is getting one of these books that then also links them back to First Five Forever and to their local um, library. Why had I gone down that track? Uh, oh, yeah, Queensland Health and the book, you know, and then how do we, because if they've got, nurses and people talking about it how are they also saying oh have you gone to the library do you know that they've got this have you seen that that um and I also think that and I made that plea at the beginning of just how that parent messaging the language that we use of not making it too scary and aloof we had a sort of particular moment when we were doing some training with uh of cap you know workshops with um uh, public library staff and Indigenous Knowledge Centre staff 
And they took us aside at lunchtime and said, we believe you, we believe the research. We just want to know how to do it. What does emergent literacy mean? You know, like how do we um, use the evidence, know that it's behind what we're doing, but we don't have to sort of labour it to every audience. So um, I think that that being able to um, think of the metaphors, but also that talk, play, sing, read, you know, like how to uh, potentially do that, or what are some of the other active ways we can describe those activities and programs? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Anyone wants to talk? Thanks, Louise. That was great. Um, and it, you know, it's certainly an example of something that has scaled um, and is still growing and evolving, um, meeting local needs um, that, you know, potentially we could replicate elsewhere. Um, our next speaker for today. Um, is someone that I met a bit over a year ago. Um, we were talking about early literacy and she had come across the uh, draft uh, early language and literacy uh, strategy. Um, and it was of interest to her because um, she works in uh, the curriculum area at TAFE and it had given her some food for thought about uh, some areas for reform and improvement. Um, so our next speaker is Michelle Chapo from TAFE New South Wales. Um, Michelle is an industry innovation specialist with TAFE New South Wales. And in this role, she's responsible for engaging with the early childhood education and care sector, working collaboratively to identify needs and innovative solutions to current and future workforce requirements. TAFE New South Wales is Australia's leading provider of vocational education and training with over 500,000 annual enrolments. As the New South Wales public provider, it supports the New South Wales government's priority to grow skills for the economy and critically, TAFE New South Wales plays a vital role in providing vocational education in rural and regional New South Wales and job training pathways for the most vulnerable in the community. Today, Michelle joins us to talk about the current curriculum for the Certificate 3 and the Dipl Diploma of Early Childhood Education and Care. These qualifications are held by the majority of the national ECEC workforce. She will give an overview of some of the areas that could be changed and improved to increase the job readiness of graduates in general, but with specific reference to early language and literacy. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thanks very much, Karen. So I just wanted to start um, with an acknowledgement. TAFE New South Wales acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land, rivers and sea. We acknowledge and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging of all nations. And I just wanted to also acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, peoples we have joining us in the meeting today. So um, as Skira mentioned, my role is as industry innovation specialist, and it is to engage with the sector but, and to think about how we use that information. So I do that in two main ways. One is to look at what is the current and emerging research that's happening across the field, and also what is happening as far as government initiatives and, and things like the strategies that we've been talking about today and bring that information back into TAFE New South Wales, but also act for TAFE New South Wales as a representative of those sectors um, and be engaged in things like events today and having those conversations about where we can go in the future as well as taking the information from the research and what's happening as far as government strategies, it's also about engaging with the sector. So having those everyday conversations with early childhood services, but also government agencies, peak bodies and um, research organisations. So 
I'm going to talk about this from a two pronged approach. One is how I take that information from, from research and strategy, and two, how we bring together industry and the sector to then influence what it is that we can do with that information. So when it comes to language and literacy at TAFE New South Wales, we've started thinking about some key things. One being what um, we know about adult literacy in, in Australia. Now, the importance of that for us is this is our student base that we're drawing our students from. So we have to really understand what is going on for our student base as far as their literacy needs. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with some of these st statistics, but what we know in regards to industry is organisations are telling us that 99% of them are impacted by low levels of literacy and numeracy in their organisations. So this is something that is felt right across all industry areas. We know one in seven Australians have um, literacy skills that actually impact their daily lives, things like filling out forms and being able to engage in employment. Um, so that's a real concern to us because that also means that our students are impacted by this. Um, I raised the issue around um, the multicultural nature of Australia and our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population and their home languages. Um, not because literacy is a significant problem in any of those areas, but because the multicultural nature of our society brings a new complexity to the way we have to think about how we educate educators in regards to their literacy and the way that we deliver our tertiary education, and also the way in which we need to support those educators to be able to support children in home languages and um, different approaches to literacy. Uh, so we know that we have 42% um, of Australians with a parent born, born overseas and 27.6% of our own population is born overseas. We have 5.5 million people using a language other than English at home. And um, you can see 167 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages were spoken um, amongst just over 78,000 people in 2021. So it's incredibly diverse, which means that our educators have to understand how to deliver education to children from incredibly diverse backgrounds. So that adds significant complexity to the work that we do. So what are the impacts for actually working with children in this sector? We currently know that about 23% of Australians' children are not de developmentally on track in regards to language skills when they start school. Now, we've heard those figures before, but why is that incredibly concerning? Because birth to five is when the majority of that language learning should be happening. So if we're already 23% you know, of an issue, it, we, we've got a we've got a, a big issue. We've, we've we've got a big problem that we need to address. We also know that early childhood education has been identified as a strong indicator of children's ability to have good quality literacy skills later in adulthood, um, which is not surprising given how much language learning occurs in those early years. Currently, our early childhood system does not make a clear distinction between learning English and learning literacy. So we're not even addressing that complexity, let alone all the other complexities that go along with how do I support first languages for a, for a child for, who was you know, just immigrated from India? How do I support um, oral languages approaches from my child in my local community who um, is of an Indigenous background? Um, we know that evidence supports strategies focusing on explicit systematic instruction, including phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary and language structure. Um, I'm going to show you in a little bit what is actually included in the National Training Package for Certificate 3 and Diploma. Um, I can tell you those words are not mentioned. Okay. Um, feedback on the educator literacy skills um, helped inform the National Early Language and Literacy Strategy in Priority 2 about the need to embed these skills for educators in the qualifications, okay, because that's the children group they're working with. Um, and I can tell you also that it's not currently explicit in those qualifications. 
Early childhood educators are crucial in supporting the development of early language and literacy. Um, and we know that professional development programs where we actually educate educators as to how to support these skills, um, it actually has a direct impact on the outcomes for children. So we know that this is definitely something positive that we want to pay attention to. So my role is to think about all of those things that are happening in the research and what we know about um, educators, what we know about the population and the needs, and then to engage with the industry. Now, the way that at TAFE New South Wales we have um, started to do that is by employing these roles of the, early, the industry innovation specialist who can focus their attention on thinking about um, current government policy, thinking about research, but also engaging with the sector as a whole. And one of the ways that we do that is through our industry collaboration reference groups. We, we meet with these groups twice a year. Um, and the whole role of these groups is to bring together those peak bodies, early childhood services, research organisations, and have discussions on what are the national priorities we need to be thinking about across the curriculum. So we look for advice on um, workforce development requirements, training requirements, advice from them on innovative models for learning, um, feedback on our current training packages, um, and also what are some of the ways that we can do things a little bit differently? Where can we perhaps seek funding from and how can we start to influence change in what is going on with the tertiary education sector? Um, it's my job then to take that information back into TAFE New South Wales to influence what it is that we do going forward. And today I'll give you a little bit of an example of how that comes together. So just to give you a bit of a, um, insight into the scope of this kind of collaboration, um, I work with two other team members across the health wellbeing sector. Um, in August, we had um, 21 industry collaboration reference groups that we held that included um, over 250 industry representatives um, and more than 40 hours of discussion. So as you can imagine, that was a huge amount of intel to then start to analyse and distill and think about the ways in which that intel could be used to better education. So um, on the first little um, block there, you'll see an example of some of the groups that are involved in the industry collaboration reference group that is specifically for early childhood education and care. Um, some of those members um, were at the August meeting. Some of those members are new and just starting to engage with us. And we're actually right in the middle of our next round of industry collaboration groups these two weeks. I'm actually missing two today to be here today, but my colleagues are um, covering um, for us, which is great. Now, specifically in the area of language and literacy there were some key messages that came out of the august group and that were reiterated last week um, in the in the march round so one of the things that has been spoken about is that graduates are coming out without that real passion for the sector that we are used to seeing. And they also spoke to me about their concerns that people were enrolling in the qualifications and not staying in the qualifications. And we can think of lots of reasons for that. People talk about, you know, low pay rates and conditions and all of those things. But I think what was so fascinating about this discussion is they felt that a big part of that lack of joy and interest was the missing content around really play-based pedagogies and how these educators could, could learn to use play to teach children about language and literacy and STEM and creative arts and, and all of that content. And they felt that that was a real key to why educators were lacking that joy and passion. Um, so, 
The other thing that was brought up, and I've kind of discussed all those points in one, but the other thing that was brought up was the literacy demands of the job role. They actually felt that, that the demands of the job role so as far as literacy was increasing and that our graduates had a lack of literacy skills. And what we know about the training packages um, in the VET sector is that they um, there is not good facility for delivering and assessing content around students actually developing their literacy skills. And a lot of people are often surprised at that, um, but it is a very competency-based approach to education. So we look at, can a student accomplish something or do they understand it? Can they do it? Um, but there is limited focus on the literacy skills as far as writing to achieve that. So we talked about a few um, solutions potentially um, about how we could um, collaborate to embed the missing content in the teaching materials, um, how we could use um, evidence-based train, um, training package feedback to support ag advocacy for training package enhancement, looking at micro skills, micro credentials, things that we can do. Um, but Really, what we really want to do is to have a long-term solution that makes real and lasting change to the education that our educators get as part of that national training package because that is the only way to ensure that every educator across the country actually leaves their qualification prepared with those skills. So one of the things that we're starting to think about is um, a replication of a program that we're, that we're already doing, where we're looking at, we have done a workshop on um, supporting children with disability and how to um, identify and include children with disabilities that has been running in far west in rural areas um, for um, educators in those rural sectors because the NDIA indicated to us those educators were having difficulty with retention because of a lack of preparedness for supporting children and families with high and complex needs. We've then been doing evaluation around that and Training Services New South Wales have supported us in that process. The hope is that that evaluation will support a really high quality evidence-based approach to thinking about how we then might develop some units for the training package. And my hope is that um, out of these discussions, we'll be able to implement something similar in the language and literacy area. To give you a bit of an insight about what's not in the curriculum, a certificate of three has 15 units, 15 core units and two electives. Each unit in a training package has about four to six elements. And each of those elements might have five to eight performance criteria under, under it. Um, you then have a set of performance evidence criteria and a set of knowledge evidence criteria of about 20 to 30 dot points, okay? Every unit has that. Currently in the Cert 3, there is one unit about supporting holistic development. In that unit, it has six elements. There is one element on supporting children's communication, okay? Um, it doesn't talk about progression of language development. It doesn't talk about diverse language needs. Okay. Student literacy um, in regards to the training package only addresses fundamental skills, being through really documents and legislation and by components of that performance to, to the knowledge criteria. Okay, that's as far as it goes. Diploma, 12 core units, three electives. Um, again, you've got a unit that covers generalist development overall. It has two performance criteria related to language and literacy, so not even a whole element, okay? Um, and again, the student literacy is just that application of documents. What we think needs to happen um, and really understanding fully what needs to happen won't happen until we sit down and start to unpack it. Um, engage with people like you to say, what should it look like? Because that's my role is to start bringing in people like this that are in this room to say, here's what we're thinking the curriculum should look like. What feedback can you give us? 
Um, and then as far as a national strategy, what we would like to see is that um, registered training organisations have a strong voice in being able to say, this is the engagement we've done with the research. This is the engagement we've done with the sector. These are the things they're telling us that we, they think needs to be in the curriculum going forward and that we're able to have a voice to influence that national training package. But we will, in the meantime, start to work on what we can do as far as providing that education to educators out in the field and getting that feedback and gathering that data um, to put something together. So... That's where we are at the moment. I will, I have managed to leave, I think, five minutes for any questions. Does anyone in the room have a question or um, I just wanted to ask how you're working with other RTOs in this space to try and pull together that national strategy. I know the Mitchell Institute many years ago wanted to try and reform how training is provided to early childhood educators, but I don't think they were able to progress that work. So I'm just interested in how you're working with others to, to look at having a standardised approach to how educators are taught. Yeah, thank you. Um, TAFE New South Wales has done quite a bit of collaborative work at the moment with TAFE Queensland. Um, we've been sharing a lot of resources back and forth across the states. The other strategy that we're using is working with the industry training advisory body. Uh, they're a body that help um, feed information into government as to what is needed in the sector and where training packages need to go. Um, I've actually got a meeting next week with them um, and with um, the, the uh, training advisory body for Western Australia. So we're looking at options of working with the ITAB in WA as well as the ITAB in Victoria. Um, because that opens up a range of options as to the way some of those courses might be accredited because there are slightly different accrediting um, processes in the different states. But, yeah, so lot, lots of consultation. <laughs> Sam? Hi, Michelle. And I just wanted to, you and I have talked about this already, but I wanted to um, run it past the group because I, I wonder whether there's a role for this in the, in the strategy going forward. And that is about um, the potential for micro-credentialing early childhood educators. So we're talking beyond the certificate or the diploma, um, but micro-credential in language development and um, and allied health, supporting speech, um, development, identifying children perhaps with speech difficulties, not becoming speech pathologists yeah. themselves, but being able to um, support and assist um, children and identify children who might be having difficulties and, and help them get to the other allied health services that they might be able to use and what you think that looks like um, and how we might progress that in terms of the new industry cluster in VET uh, and the changes more generally happening in the VET sector. Thanks, Sam. It, it's such a, an opportune time for having those discussions because the way in which training packages are going to look in the future is very much up in the air. We, we don't have clear indication as far as the new jobs and skills um, councils as to what that training package development is actually going to look like. And that's because it's you know, not completely decided yet. There is lots of conversation about increasing the synergies between VET and higher ed, which bodes well for those kinds of discussions because micro skills and micro credentials um, are a big part of the way that the government and the research says that we should be looking at how we can actually cross some of those, those boundaries. Um, we also, I work very closely with the industry innovation specialist in the allied health sector. Um, so our goal at TAFE New South Wales will be to look at how, because the other conversation that's happening with jobs and skills councils and training package development is how they can also be better streamlining between um, identified skills that perhaps are generic across multiple, multiple qualifications and how we can actually credential people um, to move between those qualifications. Yet we, we also have this emerging job role in the sector of educators who are moving into that um, identification disability support space where there is no actual qualification for those roles. They are pulling from an early childhood workforce to, to, fill, those, to fill those roles. 
Um, it's a complex space, the micro-credentialing space, because you're going from a VET sector that has a national curriculum framework um, to a higher ed sector that is not a national curriculum. And so credentialing conversations with multiple universities who have different um, accrediting guidelines than the VET sector does becomes a very complex discussion. Um, and can I stand here and say I have the solution to that? No, I don't. But what I do hope these conversations um, trigger is the need to include registered training organisations in those discussions. TAFE New South Wales, we have a certificate three in the diploma, but we also have a Bachelor of Early Childhood birth to five. Um, that is a four year um, early childhood degree delivered across five different campuses in TAFE New South Wales. So we have very good ability for being able to micro-credential <laughs> across our qualifications um, within TAFE, but that becomes a bigger conversation more broadly. Um, hi, I just wanted to comment on um, the feedback from the sector around the absence of joy um, in, the, in the training. You know, we hear so much about poor pay, poor conditions yeah. and, you know, the difference between the early childhood sector, the school sector, you know, what it is that can be expected of, uh, by someone working in those, those different places. So such an interesting spotlight yeah. to shine on that. And one, I think that um, we need to be talking about more. Mm. And I've been speaking to one of your colleagues about the STEM uh, side uh, of the um, courses. Yes, so, yeah. uh, but, but that actually didn't come out of our conversation. So thank you for sharing that because I think that's something really important for us to be aware of and to be focusing on because mm. it's not um, it's not one problem. It's it's a much broader issue. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I think I really wanted Michelle to talk today because I think um, that's a real structural issue that sits across the country, uh, and and addressing that would have huge ramifications. Um, now and into the future as to the skills that are in our workforce and, and people with those qualifications don't just work in early childhood um, and education and care they work in libraries and, and many other places in the broader early early years um, so now we're going to break for lunch uh, for 45 minutes um, we should be back here at around 1 45 for the people on zoom um, and uh, we'll have a couple of more speakers um, and uh, we should finish up around three o'clock. So thank you, please enjoy some lunch and we'll be back here at uh, 1.45. Um, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. Um, 
So we've got two more speakers uh, left for this afternoon and then um, Gail will come back and, and sum up and talk a bit about uh, the coalition and, and what we're doing and where to next. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Jane Vadavalu from Children's Ground and that's an organisation known well to Erasi. Um, determined to end intergenerational just injustice and disadvantage, Jane is working towards a future where all children, especially First Nations children, enjoy respect and agency over their lives. With a master's degree in forensic psychology, Jane has lived and worked with First Nations communities in the Northern Territory for over 30 years, establishing strength and justice-based approaches to achieve systemic and long-term change. In 2000, Jane and the Arunda people in Central Australia co-founded Akalera, um, one of the first organisations based on First Nations knowledge systems in traditional healing and wellbeing in Australia. Through work and direction of elders and community leaders, Jane co-started Children's Ground, a systems change organisation that privileges First Nations knowledge and practice. It is a 25 year approach led by communities who have vision and solutions, but experience unacceptable trauma and disadvantage because of social, cultural and economic injustice. It's designed for the next generation of First Nations children to have the right to determine their future and enjoy economic, political, social and cultural wellbeing. And today I've asked Jane to, to talk about um, well-being at the intersection of health and education. And I think she's going to cover that uh, in the context of the communities within which she works. So please welcome me in joining in. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I uh, want to recognize these beautiful unceded lands of First Nations people, both here um, and across the country, and the ancestors and the elders and the young people who have laughed and lived on these lands for generations and will continue to do so and will be the next generation of leaders of the oldest living cultures in the world. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really honoured that you've actually asked me to come and speak with you all and be included in this conversation I've really enjoyed today so far. Um, so what I'm going to do is speak to Children's Ground. I'm the CEO of Children's Ground, a First Nations organisation. But I want to start, I guess, looking at some of the themes that have all be, already been raised today. And I want to start first with some words from Felicity Hayes, who's the traditional owner from Bantua, Alice Springs, and she speaks to what we do at Children's Ground. Our relationship with the land is the reason why we base the children's education on country. Nurturing the relationship with the country nurtures family and communities. When you are on country, you can feel the spirits of the land and the ancestors with you. We are communicating with them and they are uh, our guardians, our guardians. We don't own the land, the land owns us. We don't own it, it owns us. The land is a family member and we all have different relationships and responsibilities to it. This includes the Yemba Mapa, the children. The land is our greatest teacher. It's like a book. Learning our country makes our children strong in their culture and language. We want to make sure our children grow up to be proud of who they are. So when we speak about the intersection, of literacy, health and well-being, the First Nations people, all of the laws, all of the knowledge systems, all of the well-being begins on the land. So if we think about what we did through colonisation, is we removed that through invasion and then we also removed the rights to economic freedoms by removing the land. So understanding children's ground and systemic reform for First Nations people is critical. Understanding the relationship with the land underpins everything. So where I wanted to start this conversation is culture being the key determinant for well-being and for learning. A lot of you will know the work of UNESCO, 
and that they have for a very, very long time, decades spoken about only by respecting the language, culture and knowledge of the learner can we together build literate, schooled and educated societies where lifelong learning is the norm, which is what we are all here to achieve. Children who are educated in their first language and through their first culture perform better and are set up for success. And we have the international research. The growing body of research, this is back to 2012. So we've had this research at our hands for a very long time. The recommendation that kids be taught through their first language for six to eight years of their life. And the outcomes will be that they will receive a good foundation where they can transfer their literacy and numeracy skills to additional languages. They perform better. They excel better at school. school. Fewer children repeat grades. Fewer children drop out of school. Children have more family support. Why? Because when children learn in their mother tongue, parents and families can be involved. They are engaged and they are empowered in their children's education. When children are learning in a second or a foreign language, families are so often excluded. And the cycles of exclusion are broken. So we've known this research for a long time. The World Bank, bless them, put out this fantastic paper in 2021 where they spoke of language, first languages. And they said globally, globally shockingly low learning outcomes may be a reflection of inadequate language instruction policies. That this is creating learning poverty at a global level. They found in their literature review that academic outcomes are better for children when they are taught and assessed in their first languages. They have a range of principles for governments across the world. And this should be also for our governments here. That short children should be taught in a language they understand starting with early child education and care for at least six years of primary school and continue to have that right all the way through school while introducing the second language. Most of us in this field know that that is what the international research says. So what does that mean for us here in Australia with first languages? There were over 300 first languages prior to invasion. We now have about 120 languages that are still spoken. We've lost 25 languages since 2014. There are 100 of those 120 languages are severely and critically endangered. That leaves us with 13 that are considered strong and that means they are being spoken across all generations. And I'm incredibly lucky to work with a number of those languages. At the same time, First Nations people who have lost their languages are trying to revive them. The old people say, the language is never dead. The language is waiting. It is resting in the land for you. And people are reviving their languages. What does this mean about our policy? At a national level for equity and justice, in early childhood. The denial of language and culture by the state across many countries has resulted in the damage to children that impacts their health, their mental health and their cultural health. And I see it every single day. The denial has led to the devastation of languages. Let's face it, incredible trauma and with that cultural oppression. It affects children's learning, it affects their health, it affects their well-being. And we also know from the literature and the research that culture is a protective factor. It is a determinant to prevent suicide. It is a determinant for health and well-being. 
in the communities that lead children's ground, this is what they say. We have started a treadmill of assimilation earlier in our children's life. So yes, let's celebrate early childhood access. But what are we giving access to? Is it first culturally designed early childhood? There is a disruption to family, cultures and languages. Our children are asked to leave their culture at the door if they are to succeed. People talk about getting kids ready for school. It's a point that you made earlier, I think, Ruth. But we want schools to be ready for our kids. This is just one bit of evidence because there's not a lot. As you imagine, the research is dominated by non-First Nations people around the world. So there's very little evidence of culturally protective, protective factors. But this is a cracker, right? This is communities in um, Canada where they looked at cultural empowerment factors to lower suicide rate. The more cultural factors within a community, the lower the suicide rate. Striking. We know it on the ground. We see it on the ground every day. So Western research in early childhood focuses on access to early years, not the quality of the early years, yeah. right? And KPIs that are through a Western lens. So if you are the leaders in the field speaking to government, you need to think about this really carefully because you're the ones that have the voices and the ear to government. First Nations families often have no access to early childhood or if they do, they're Western early childhood design systems. There's almost no Australian research on the potential for cultural damage and harm in relation to learning of instruction and cultural practices in early childhood schooling anywhere, because that's not the lens we see things through. We apply a deficit lens to First Nations people rather than a strength-based lens. First Nations communities and people have 65,000 years of early childhood knowledge systems and practices, which are spectacular. And I can say that from a non-First Nations perspective as a psychologist. They absolutely, I don't, I only know a rude word, but they absolutely are superior in so many ways to Western systems of early childhood. And they are particular to First Nations people. And what First Nations people want are the resources to raise their children as First Nations children. And that's what we need to remember. And we need to remember that language and culture is a determinant of educational success. So children's ground, what do we do at children's ground? This is just a reminder of our cohort on the very bottom, zero to four. Look how many more First Nations zero to fours there are compared to non-First Nations. We, our communities are very young. A third of the population is under the age of 15. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little kids and lots of old people passing away. <clears throat> and where we work, the reality is our kids are more likely to die at birth. Highest infant mortality rate in the Northern Territory in the whole of Australia. Our kids are living in economic poverty everywhere, in every single household. More are likely to live with a disability, more are likely to be taken into welfare most not likely to finish school, more likely to end up in jail, more likely to be unemployed, experience suicide, live with chronic illness, they will experience racism. And right now, our kids are gonna die 20 years younger than any other child. And that is a complete failure of our system. So this is where children's ground came from. How do we prevent this? And it is a solution that has come from the communities. So I now want to lean you to the most brilliant human being, like strategist, thinker, spectacular professor, elder, knowledge holder, MK, who's going to speak to Children's Ground. We want the Children's Ground, our children to be taught in a proper way. Our children to learn in a manner how they grow up with the land, how they grow with the language and the people and the family 
and their mother and their grandmother beside them and the language so they can grow together. My name is Margaret Kamara Turner. I'm the first old lady who wanted to start this children's crown. We want to start all these kids just to know their language. Grow up with their language. Grow up knowing about the dirt, growing about the trees, about the fire, about the ant nest, about the ant hole, about the ant, about the lizards. We want to get those kids, children, growing up with that. The language is so important because language is dying out. Allah. I want to get them to learn from the ground because that's what we, we are from. Aboriginal people learn from ground by hunting, getting water, doing things, making things, singing, dancing, and living in it, maintaining connection to culture, language, and people, you know? Yeah. That's why mothers, grandmothers teaching their children, learning, going on people's land and seeing, you know, that's, that's one of the best things. That's how we teach. That's our, that's our education. That's our literacies and numeracies. It's, it's that way. So MK speaks multiple languages. She's been a linguist for 50 years. She was one of the people that developed the Aranda Dictionary. She was just awarded a doctorate this year, um, for, or I think it might have been last year. No, it was this year, last year. Um, just, you know, she got an order of Australia Medal years and years and years ago. But she has spoken forever, for 25 years that I've known her. Our Aranda language is getting weak and kids' English is weak, and both of them need to be strong. So what is Children's Ground? It's a 25-year strategy for systemic reform. It is how do we get the next generation of kids to live with economic, cultural, social health justice. The First Nations organisation, the Children's Ground approach was designed by First Nations people that carries on the work of a whole lot of elders for many, many, many decades into a systemic approach. There are 10 communities in the Northern Territory in different places, remote town, regional that are leading this work and evidencing it. We are basing it on First Nations knowledge systems at Murangjela, which everything is connected. You cannot separate health from education, from anything else. You can't separate a child from an elder. It is all connected. That is the First Nations systems of knowledge. We have 10 practice principles we integrate five systems of delivery on the ground. Learning and well-being starting from early childhood. So we start with this generation of children and ensure a platform through their whole journey that privileges them, their culture, their languages, their people, their knowledge systems and Western knowledge systems and skills. Integrating health, community development, cultural development and economic development because all of those things are critical. We cannot separate these things out. We have a 25 year longitudinal study where we're tracking outcomes against health outcomes, early childhood outcomes, educational outcomes, cultural outcomes, economic outcomes, safety outcomes, and employment outcomes for families. Our learning is on country, it's based in centre, it is around first cultural knowledge, Western numeracy and literacy, creative arts, child and maternal health, family health, social emotional being environmental health, nutrition and employment. 
because if we don't do all of that, we can't do anything. When you have 20 people living in a house with sewerage that's backed up, the dogs eating the sewerage, the dogs licking the kids' faces, kids' machine, people don't have white goods. So all of those disadvantages are a daily reality for people. But yet people emerge every single day to lead for a different future with an incredible knowledge system that underpins it. And that has been formed into curriculum pedagogy from early childhood through, which is consistent with the EYLF. And every First Nations community around this country can do this. There's absolutely no question about it. So yes, first language in English, we're creating the resource because they don't exist. <laughs> it's the families that are creating them in first language digitizing, delivering. So that's just a very, very quick snapshot of the whole of children's ground. Within the children's ground approach is the family health and wellbeing space. We have a whole framework just on family health and wellbeing. Currently funded by Australian government just until the 30th of June. Health promotion, cultural health, social emotional wellbeing, maternal and child health, community and environmental the agency people have in their health, taking health into community where kids live on a daily level, not stuck in a clinic waiting for an appointment. So how do we bring that to, oh, this is just one stat of one health issue that kids have in an NT, otitis media. One in 10 Aboriginal children younger than three has a healthy year. year. One in 10. How crazy is that? Five have otitis media or some and four have other hearing issues, which we know in early childhood is going to be devastating for learning. Now, that is not a simple fix. Yes, you can get the audiologist. Yes, you can go and get hit. But what are you going to do with the overcrowding? What are you going to do with the health issues? All the stuff that feeds the health of the ill health of the ear also feeds the ill health of dental issues. It's a complex environment of oppression and injustice that leads to these challenges that our kids live with. <clears throat> so on the ground every day, we are doing comprehensive nutrition, physical health, cultural health, social emotional wellbeing, safety, obviously big issue for kids, creating places of safety that are led by community in that community. Not you have to leave that community to get something, but building the social, cultural, economic capital in that community for the lifelong journey of these kids and their future generations. <clears throat> cultural health systems are critically important. And there's many of them. They're about the connection to country. There's bush medicines, traditional healers, ceremonies, bush foods, knowledge transfer, kinship relationships, adherence to customary law. We go out on country and you have to sing out to the ancestors so that they know those kids are coming. And those kids then will be safe. There's just, that's one of 50 squillion things that people have to align with in terms of their cultural responsibilities. This baby's being introduced to the country so the country knows the baby. So it's a proper ceremony. Smoking ceremonies for healing, for well, well, um, well-being. We've just reinstituted baby smoking. So it had stopped. So the maternal and child health, now all the little umber cookers are gonna start being smoked again on country which is a critical early childhood process. But nutrition, teeth, immunisations, every day integrated into learning. Count how many sores you have. How do you clean them? What are those sores linked to? Oh, kidney failure. It, it's all of that. Integrating health literacy into literacy. Oops. Nutrition's massive for us. We know that if we can bring a generation of kids through with comprehensive nutrition, that will be the foundation for future health. So we focus on that massively. Trauma. Our kids live with it every day. How can you learn if your emotional well-being is jangled when you come in? So making sure kids settle in their emotions, in their body, in their spirit before they learn. I love this one. Okay. <laughs> 
um, the sensory play, which we know is beautiful in early childhood, but so critical to our kids who have a, live with a lot of trauma before they can engage. And our partnerships with specialists. So audiologists bring them out to community to test everyone. This young kid on the left had profound hearing issues. He'd been completely missed. When we started, he was five or six years old and his grandmother I hardly spoke. She was just so beside herself. When they came, they tested, we got them to come out. They tested everyone in the community. And they picked up kids, they picked up adults. So dental health, at partnership, so that kids, we have a standing appointment there. And then we evaluate. And I'm just going to go through this quickly, but that's an example of three years of people dying in one community. Right? That's how many deaths and funerals happen that interrupt people's lives. The black, the red, the blue are the, are the um, people dying, and the and the grey the funerals. This is the attendance engagement of school with family employment. One feeds the other. In Central Australia, only fourteen percent of kids had engaged in early early childhood when we started because it was not accessible. Now we have over eighty percent. The key drivers, culturally designed, local governance, employment, empowerment, integrated services. I won't go into that data. Um, but key issues of health, nutrition, ear health, dental health, skin sores. If you get a boil, how can you sit down? And the number of kids I've seen that can't learn because they can't sit down because they've got a boil. You know, so all of these things are things that we have to be tracking. And the impact is improved nutritional intake, improved physical health, health literacy and knowledge, health behaviours, blowing your nose, understanding the combinations, integrated into literacy, improved kids' health coming from families, improved nutrition, improved food security. So health, learning and wellbeing, I'm just racing through this, it requires justice and equity. It requires all of our voices speaking to that within the system. It requires culture. It requires local governance and decision-making. It has to be driven by the people. If you are in New Zealand and you're Māori, you can go into early childhood in Māori and go to, all the way to university in Māori. Same in, New, in Hawaii. So we are working with first cultural educators at a national level through Chera Pampa to establish First Nations education system led by First Nations people, not necessarily trained in the West, but led by the elders, professors, the people. This is the fundamental right for First Nations people. This is what our benchmark should be as leaders that are pushing for policy change, is those rights for every First Nations community. And we want to build the evidence to achieve that. And this is what Roxanne said as a young leader. Children's Ground is about the families walking together, sharing knowledge and culture. We sit down and we decide, how do we work together to build a future to put their heads up for the next generation. That's it. Um, thank you for your presentation. The question I had was, you mentioned New Zealand and Hawaii and what they have available for their First Nations peoples. Um, what do you think in terms of the challenges of the number of languages in, in Australia, which, you know, unfortunately, as you say, is um, diminishing, but um, is there, what's the way to be able to, obviously it's not like New Zealand where there's the one language and so that makes it much more challenging is, yeah, is there any sort of insights you would have about not having government to think, oh, well, it's too hard? Yeah, it's why I love the World Bank paper, Loud and Clear, because it speaks really clearly to so many of these languages globally are spoken by small numbers of people and governments will often say it's not cost efficient for us to do this and they're saying it absolutely is and it's the investment that should be made. And certainly here in Australia, First Nations people know their governance systems. They know... We do welcome to countries everywhere. We're just catching up, right? So what we want to see happen is a national First Nations-led education system starting from early childhood 
And Uchera Pampa is this national network of first cultural educators. What they want to do is set the standards, resources and practice, but allow each community to determine their own, what their system of learning looks like for them, because it will look different everywhere. And we've talked about this today around play space and what is achievable from libraries to anywhere. And every single place should have language and resource centres, everyone, everywhere. That's what you have in your libraries, right? So it's actually what the World Bank is saying makes economic sense as in terms of the productivity for the country. You know, the World Bank's not stepping into this because they're early childhood specialists. They're stepping into it because they know there's economic advantage to the community. So it is an argument, and I've heard it for years, and when I read what they wrote in their report, I was thinking, thank goodness we now have a global body that is saying it is the right investment. And it's not just in Australia, it's happening around the world, but there needs to be investment. And where we had those in the 80s was a great period of time for a lot of bilingual education. And there were a number of um, resource and language centres around the country. And they all sort of, so many of them just got defunded over the 90s and 2000s. And same with first cultural educators. And so we now, we had this incredible period of phenomenal educators and resources. And now we've had a 20 year, um, you know, glut in that. So, or what's the other word? Well, anyway, so we just, we haven't had an investment for 20 years basically. And so we, we don't have the next generation of teachers coming through. We don't have the resources coming through. Everything we're doing at Children's Game, we don't get funded through the education department. You know, we get some funding from NIAA, but because it's seen as not mainstream, it doesn't get supported. So we do it through philanthropy but and we get um, some languages funding from the, NT, from the Australian government as well, which is, uh, and that languages program, Indigenous languages program, ILA, is fabulous, but it's just, it doesn't have enough funding. Um, oh, thank you for a really powerful presentation. And I think uh, really uh, struck me that how do we make sure we're not doing harm through our programs that we're delivering and something I think how to be eyes wide open when we're, <laughs> when we're going in and thinking and talking about that. But I do think that um, given this amazing holistic picture that you've painted, that, you know, it's not just one domain or one stream, how to do that. But I'm also uh, really aware, just thinking of the broader strategy of the funding that Indigenous languages get and how are the Indigenous language centres and one's just closed in Queensland, which is just devastating, but, and so much work, but that's, again, Commonwealth funded community-based organizations. I think the one in Cairns is one language center, 60 languages, two yeah, exactly. people, you know, yeah, like, it's um, crazy. but what is this? Uh, and certainly, uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. It's just the, the, how are we joining up so that if there is this broader strategy, how is the funding around indigenous languages not not only linguist, linguists, but also the early years programming and um, activities. And just, I think also, obviously this push and this interest that there is this enormous interest there. Uh, there was a languages project done in uh, Southeast Queensland in Bow Desert with the Bunjalung. It's just gone off this yeah. book that's been created, but been led by the elders and the community and this one little publication, but is being used. So it is what people are looking for people often. If you can have, yeah. if you go in with that sort of approach to develop it. So, yes, yeah, so I just, um, Mackay Library did it with the UE language or the community did it with the UE language and translating the hungry caterpillar. So it's yeah. just all of these little different projects, but they, use this bit of money or that bit of money, but there isn't this strategy. And maybe that's something really to be thinking about for I the think early be, years strategy. Yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly, if, imagine if we had national policy investment in first languages from early childhood. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's really what we should be doing. And that's what all the evidence says, yeah. you know, from outcomes for kids learning through to cultural health and justice. So 
that you know for us that's what we look at as the big picture and we're trying to build an evidence base because we know it's very hard to get there so our what we're trying to do is in three to five regions put in place this model build the evidence base over 20 years we're in it for the long haul because we know it's not going to happen tomorrow but maybe once we get the evidence base it'll push things but I think that there is a groundswell there's a massive interest around the country around first languages um, the complexity of the number of nations that we have in this country it's it's complex but it's exciting you know and if we went to Europe and said sorry we're not going to use German and, and Spanish and you know that's all too hard we're just going to use one everyone would be outraged so that is the diversity of our languages in this country and it should be something that we go through a truth-telling process to understand and celebrate and invest in and the outcomes will be spectacular that's why why do kids we, we I was saying to Ruth earlier we we can't we have had this incredible explosion of early childhood engagement. We have to turn kids away because we don't have the buses. That's how many kids want to come. And why do they want to come? Because their families are there and it's their language and their culture. So we're not doing anything special. You know, once you create an environment that is culturally responsive and speaks to a child, they're just going to thrive, you know, and it's, and it's a beautiful, amazing thing to watch. You know, it's incredible. So... I agree with you. It should be at a national level and it should be for all communities that want to create their first languages. Um, so you said that you don't get any government funding. So when you work with um, communities and you publish books, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who owns the rights to those books? The, kid, the families. Oh. Yeah. So, and not that we don't get any, we get some NIAA funding for our early childhood and we get ILA funding for some of the resource development. So, but in terms of the, the bulk of our early childhood is funded through philanthropy. Um, but yeah, all of those rights stay with the community. So we have agreements with both the illustrators and the writers and there's co-contributors as you can imagine. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great, thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much, Shane. Um, so I'd like to introduce our final um, speaker for today um, and I think that she could certainly be said to understand the machinations of government. Um, our final speaker is the Honourable Kate Ellis and she's representing uh, Raising Literacy Australia. Um, Kate is formerly the federal member for Adelaide and in 2004, she made history as the youngest woman ever elected to the Australian House of Representatives. During her time in Parliament, Kate held various positions, including Shadow Minister for Education, Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Development, Shadow Minister for TAFE and Vocational Education, and Minister for Youth and Sport, Minister for Women, and Minister for Employment Participation and Child Care. Kate retired from politics prior to the general election in 2019. Kate is currently the CEO of Raising Literacy Australia in South Australia and is leading the Early Years Task Force, which is part of the South Australia Early Learning Strategy announced in June 2021. Raising Literacy was founded in 2015 and is a not-for-profit organisation committed to enriching children's lives through literacy. Their activities include reading pack programs, gifting over 2 million books to South Australian families, establishing libraries in vulnerable communities, providing professional development training to the early years sector, and to support their work, they also established a small publishing arm. Raising Literacy is the lead agency supporting this SA Early Learning Strategy and is a member of our coalition. Um, Kate had originally planned to join us in person today, but unfortunately due to some diary overload, is now having to join us via Zoom instead. Please join me in welcoming Kate. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that I am the final speaker of the day, which is a pretty tough gig at the best of times, but especially when you follow that presentation from Jane, which um, I found really amazing. Um, the scariest part of speaking you, to you today is the moment that is now approaching when I press share screen and if it works, then hopefully we've got a lovely presentation we can talk through and if it doesn't then you're going to have me feeling space for the next half an hour so let's um, 
See the moment we've been waiting for? Yeah. Whew, that is a relief. Um, okay. So what I am going to do now is, um, of course, start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, why is that not working? There we go. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. In my case, I am coming to you from Ghana country, and I'd like to recognise and respect the cultural heritage beliefs and relationship with the land, sky and waters and acknowledge that they are of continuing importance today. I'd also like to um, pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Australian people who are present today. So I'm here to talk to you about um, what is a little project in South Australia in terms of the amount of funding that we've had but that I think is quite a big project in terms of its potential impact and in terms of the work we're doing to build on um, the work that has been done in Australia and the research that has been done in Australia for the decades before us. Um, so I'll start by just explaining that in 2021, the previous South Australian government funded a um, zero to three task force. And I was lucky enough to be asked to chair that task force. And I was given two um, particular um, requests of our, our mission. The first one was to try and increase collaboration um, across the service providers working with young children and their families. And the second one was to try and introduce some consistent messaging um, so that we could make sure that we could effectively deliver the message to the South Australian public about the importance of the neuroscience in the early years. Now this task, um, this slide here is actually hideously outdated. This is from when the task force was first formed. We now have either over 35 organisations who have played a role in the task force. And I think what's important and what's interesting about this is, as you can see, it's government, um, but it's also non-government, um, not-for-profit, local government, um, and the welfare sector um, represented. Um, so we've got a broad section of skills and experience um, of organisations already working with children and their young people. Now, this is not a room that needs um, to be lectured from me about what the Australian Early Development Census um, is telling us. But what I will say is that in South Australia, we know that we are behind the national average in every single one of the tested domains. Um, we also know that whilst other states and territories are showing improvement, that we continue to be going backwards. So um, South Australian children, all Australian children need us to be doing more um, when it comes to ensuring that they are thriving before they even reach school. But this is particularly true um, in South Australia and obviously in um, a number of particular communities in South Australia as well. Um, so the data shows us that we need to do more. And when the task force came together and we first started speaking, we spoke about all of the amazing Australian research. Um, we Going back to 2009, we looked at the engaging Australians in the early childhood story research looking at um, really complex neuroscience, um, you know, the, the, um, the messages behind brain development, but then working out how do we communicate that in a really accessible way to busy parents and the general public so that it's easily understood. And since then, there's been a whole lot of amazing work done, many of it by um, those of you that are in the room today, but whether it be the frameworks, work, the core stories, and we know that there is a lot of research about the messaging around early childhood and how we both deliver it. And we were not funded to run a full scale advertising campaign, but we just decided that it would be fun and um, we would do it anyway um, because we thought it was really important and it was overdue. You know, we're in the middle of discussing our, our next early um, year strategy and we know that the last early year strategy um, one of the six priorities was to make sure that we come up with a communications campaign so that the Australian public understood how important this all is 
We actually have South Australian research that shows that one in five um, South Australian parents believe that their child's outcomes are determined by the genes that they have on the day that they are born and not by anything that happens after that, which is pretty terrifying for all of us. Um, so we decided that whilst we were asked to come up with some consistent messages, we'd actually come up with a full-scale advertising campaign. And before you think that we're, um, we had more money than we knew what to do with, um, we didn't have any money. We just decided that we'd go around begging and we'd, if we asked enough people what they could do for us for free, that um, hopefully one or two of them um, would say something. And at one stage, we ended up coming up with a jingle and recording it in my best friend's backyard, um, which uh, never made, you'll be happy to know, never made it into the public domain, but I think it did scare the South Australian government enough to offer us some more funding. So um, the government said to us, if you're going to do this, do it properly and do it professionally and do it so that if you run some small trials, it's of a quality that we'll be able to roll out further. So with some additional funding, we went out to five different advertising agencies in South Australia with all of the research that had been done by other organisations, the evidence base behind this campaign. And we said, you're the, um, you're the experts, come up with a way of putting this research into information that parents understand. Each of the five agencies came back to us with their best pitch. And we then thoroughly focus group tested what they'd given us. And there was a really clear winner, which was the Words Grow Minds campaign. It was based on evidence, um, was done in consultation, and it really spoke to the parents in um, the focus groups. And I think one of the things that's really interesting um, is sitting in on those focus groups and hearing what parents had to say. This was the hero poster that was presented to them and um, gorgeous characters, gorgeous colours, but of course a pretty serious message. What was really interesting is that whilst the other agencies um, trod pretty gently, what parents were saying is that they wanted to hear more about the science of brain development and what was happening to their children at what stage. And they actually said that this line about how much brain development was occurring in the early years wanted them to know where they could get more information and wanted them to know what they could do. So this was the um, birth of our campaign. Um, it started with a poster, it then had a radio ad, and um, it then ended up on TV. And I'm going to show you our television ad now, hopefully. Uh, that's not working for me, is it? Sorry, I knew this would happen to me. I'm terrible with technology. Your baby's mind is growing even before they arrive. The more you talk and sing and play, the more their mind will drive. I can talk with your baby, play with your baby, preach to your baby. Every time you interact with your child, you're helping grow their mind. For more information, visit wordsgrowminds.com.au. So um, that was our ad campaign, um, which we then launched um, late last year in November. Now, as I said, we didn't have any funding. Um, we, we certainly weren't supported for a media campaign. So what we did was we wanted to trial and build the evidence base on what worked and what parents responded well to. So we picked two South Australian regional communities that had their own media market, um, which means that we could invest and saturate that media market for a small amount of funding. So in November, we launched this campaign on the radios, the television screens, and as you can see here, the billboards through Mount Gambier. And currently this campaign is now running in Wyala, where we are evaluating um, the response to it, evaluating the different elements of it. Um, the important thing about this campaign is that it isn't just about the media campaign. Um, all of the organisations of our task force um, undertook the same professional development program prior to the campaign starting, which means that if you're in Mount Gambier, 
It wouldn't matter if you're at the local um, health service, if you're at the local play group, if you were um, at the local library um, for a story time session, the campaign would be reinforced in the same way by people that had done the same training and were using the same language to explain and why it was that this is so important. And the other thing which went along with it was um, every, every family member that took their child to one of these services, the libraries, the playgroups, um, CAFs, was given a resource pack, which had quite literally everything you need to do to support um, your child's brain development in those early years. Um, so we had books, activities, um, a nursery rhyme, um, a QR code to Spotify or something high tech. You've all seen how good I am at um, IT. Um, I wasn't behind that bit. But actually the most, um, the most popular thing in the pack was um, these conversation cards. And um, if you've had a child recently or been with children or grandchildren recently and are anything like me, even when you know that you need to be having those positive interactions, that you need to be engaging, it can be really hard to think of new ways to be doing that, particularly when you're not getting that much back from your child or that it's not that apparent. Um, so we came up with what is literally a, a pack of cards, um, but each day you can flip over a card and it will explain a different way that you could sing, play, talk or read with your child and keep it fresh and interesting for both of you. Parents told us that this was absolutely their favourite part of the campaign and that these cards are being used really regularly, which we think is wonderful. Um, we had a weekly calendar so that all of the organisations were um, on the same page, um, reinforcing each other's messages. And we had a range of activities um, each week, which went along with them. So we'd launch Words Grow Minds in the beginning, then we had a focus on talk and then read and then sing and then play. Um, and rather than hearing me talking, here's some pictures of some of the families enjoying the resources, getting involved. Um, one of the greatest things about this was that the collaboration between services that we saw play groups um, promoting the local library services. Um, at the moment in Wyala, we've had um, the local speech pathologists go along um, and as a result of those new connections, um, set up community times at the play groups meeting that parents and their children um, can access that service. And they're just some really cute um, kids that are getting involved in the Words Grow Mind campaign. So as I said, these were really small trials, really small pilots, um, but there's some pretty remarkable results. Um, of those, we found that 62% previously unaware of the campaign felt motivated to increase the frequency of interaction with their child. And this was really important because we were aiming to raise awareness. We weren't expecting that we would actually influence behavioural change when this campaign was running for just six weeks in the community, but we did. Um, we also found that 83% um, recognised what the key message of the campaign was. Um, this is really remarkable statistic that's just come to us that there was a 24% increase in the number of children's picture books, um, which were borrowed from the Mount Gambier Library um, once the campaign started. Um, so in terms of behavioural change and knowing that parents weren't just telling us that they were reading more or singing more, um, there is a whole range of evidence which backs that up. Um, we also found that parents recognise the importance of those activities more um, after the campaign and that they were more aware of brain development and also importantly and it's not on this slide was that they were also more aware of what services were available. So our tiny trial in Mount Gambier um, has completed. Our tiny trial in Wyala is ongoing but we're really convinced of the evidence that we're seeing. Um, we're convinced that at a time when all of us are trying to find ways that we can um, that we can convince the Australian government to be spending more in these first thousand days, that we actually need to increase community awareness of why it's so important. And we think that this is a really good way to do that. Let me see if I can stop screen sharing and then I'm gonna be completely impressed with myself. There we go. Um, 
So we're in our Wyala pilot at the moment, and we're now looking to build on this evidence base and get our independent evaluations. We hope that the next step will be a statewide rollout in South Australia. And we believe that this campaign is built, um, that we can scale up. Um, the weakness is that in these little trials, it has been a universal campaign, and we'd like to test some adaptations so that we can test some different materials for different parts of the community and have a targeted part of the campaign for children that we know are more vulnerable um, on, on all of the indicators. So we're hoping to add to it to um, convince our wonderful state government that they should fund this rollout. I think I was introduced saying that I understood about government machinations. Well, I thought I did when I was in government. I'm finding it more and more difficult um, from the outside. But um, we do think it's a really compelling case and it's part of um, the early childhood picture in Australia that we've talked about for a long time. And it's time we took our stories to the mainstream. It's time we convinced, you know, not just service providers, not just parents, but the public and the community that there is a reason that we must value these early years. And that's what we're working to do. Um, I guess importantly, I have to say, our argument is that they should fund a statewide rollout so we can test how we scale up a campaign because we think we've got a campaign that's ready to go, that's been tested, that's evidence-based, and we'd love to lay the groundwork so that once we have a new federal early year strategy, we also have a national communications campaign that's ready for a national rollout. That's my big dream. Um, and we know that there needs to be some adaptations, there needs to be some changes, but we think that the evidence already coming through in evaluations shows that there's something in this and it's talking to people and it's changing people's awareness, but it's changing people's behaviour. And that ultimately that's the way that we're gonna change children's lives and lift the AEDC results. So we're incredibly excited about it. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed some of those pictures and I'd love to, hear your questions um, or provide any further information if I can and if we can work out how to do that using this Zoom program. But thank you very much for listening to me and yeah, I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you, Kate, that was great and it's my dream too. Um, does anyone in the room have, have any questions or anyone online have any questions for Kate? Great, you made the case and everyone agrees. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Kate. Um, the, the packs that were handed out to families, what was the channel for handing those packs out? How did families lay hands on them? Yeah, excellent question. I mean, our strength is that we have the service providers who already have those relationships with families as part of our task force. So they were handed out directly by whether it's the playgroup coordinator, whether it's the CAFS um, family health nurse, um, whether it's the librarian. Um, so we went through all of our partner organisations. What we'd like to work more on in the next stage of the rollout is how we get to those communities that aren't already involved in those services. Of course, we know that um, there are a number of children who are not engaged in those services and their families aren't using them. And we need to find new distribution methods to get to them. But again, we have a lot of the um, service providers, whether it's the Smith family, Anglicare, a number of the charity organisations who are delivering outreach programs are part of our task force and they'll be um, they don't say no when we offer them packs to hand out to, to reinforce our campaign. It's something that is a win for them and it helps them get in the door or build those relationships. And it's certainly a win for us distributing those consistent materials. Uh, so we have a question in the chat and it's from Libby who's asking whether or not uh, we think that uh, first five forever and words grow minds could work together on a national campaign. Uh, I, I would I would love that. I would love the chance um, for us to share what it is that we've learned, um, what's worked, what's failed, and see what that looks like. And I think that's the power of 
forums like this one today and bringing everyone together that we can form those relationships and build on them. So yeah, I'd love to see that happen. Um, the one other thing, just in case anyone's being really polite, there is one part of our campaign where um, when it gets to play the, um, the adult blob character, as we call them, throws the baby in the air and the baby then uses its wings to fly up to the clouds. We have had a lot of feedback that we don't want to see that, so we'll be changing that. We don't advocate throwing babies in the air, but we thought if they had wings <laughs> and they were blob creatures, that might be condoned, but um, we've received feedback that it will not be. So, you know, we're open to learning and to building on other people's work and to working in partnership, absolutely. Um, no, I should mention, being a library person, that there's also another statewide program in Western Australia called Better Beginnings that yes. has been around for quite a long time as well. Um, so all three of you together could probably do some amazing things. Yeah, we've actually worked with Better Beginnings, Raising Literacy, um, provided a whole lot of their nursery rhyme books, um, which, are, which are the books that we produce. And as I said, we, this campaign is all built on collaboration. Um, it's not about this one organisation at all. As I said, there's already 35 organisations in South Australia. Um, we would expect that if there is a national rollout um, of a campaign in Australia, it shouldn't be run by one organisation. Um, it should be run in collaboration and we should be building on each other's strengths. So um, we're certainly not protective of this space at all. We're just really inspired that um, it's getting a really good reaction at the moment and we just want to keep building the momentum. Jane, did you want? Jane, Louise. Louise, <laughs> come on, Jane. Um, no, that's, uh, thank you, Kate. I just, um, Louise from, Queen, from State Library and First Five Forever. I think that it's, um, yeah, it's really wonderful. And the campaign, I was just texting my people saying, what about this? Because uh, First Five Forever was developed and there was that strong use of the frog, mm. you know, and Errol the frog and whether the frog's the right thing or what the, we've then also brought in just recently some uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, abyss, you've worked with a company, you know, with other more diverse brand, you know, so it is a, interesting thing of what resonates and how to share the information that we had. We also did some work around the frog and also whether there would be better to have other ambassadors, you know, like other early years programs have had. And uh, that overwhelming feedback from parents was that they couldn't think of anyone <laughs> that, that actually other, like you've got blob person, we've got Errol or maybe something else, you know, but it is, it would be great to bring all of our intelligences together to also see what cuts through, but really exciting to see talk, play, sing. I think you've got the other way around, talk, play, read, sing, uh, you know, but that we are, that, that that sort of everyday, everydayness of it. But I think there is a lot of um, information and that parent messaging is a really big project um, that would be good to coordinate and happy to share information. We might be in touch with you as well. I, I'd love that. Um, libraries have been such a key um, partner with us here. Um, in fact, in the Wyala trial that is underway at the moment, we're trying something else, which is every one of those packs has a mock-up library card for that baby or child and they just have to take it into the Wyala library and convert it to an actual um, library membership. But we're hoping we'll be able to measure um, a major increase in child membership in libraries at the same time. Just, just while I have you on the frog versus the characters, I, I will spare you the debate that we've had. Um, but what was really interesting is that, um, as I said, we focus group tested a whole range of um, different materials and different creative content. And what we heard back was that the parents didn't like it when we used real families, real actors, um, real people, because a number of them said, they don't look like me, they don't represent me, that we actually found when we, when we found something that was a bit more, um, you know, a bit more obscure, um, that people were more comfortable because, um, you know, it wasn't a family of a different race or a different class. It was a blob creature that everybody relates to as little or as much. And we had quite a bit of debate. We've actually changed the colours. Um, the baby was originally white and we had feedback around that. And we may change the colours a bit more in the future. Um, but it, it is really interesting when you do that focus group testing, getting the evidence base back on what families respond to 
and it wasn't always my favourites, um, but ultimately, you know, we want what works and frog or blob creature, um, sometimes that's unexpected. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, if, if no one else has got any questions, um, I might bring Gail back to the uh, front to summarise today. And um, thank you from me uh, for participating. Uh, it's, I think these things are great um, for sharing information and for making connections. So I hope that you have done that today. And for people online, um, you've seen some of the people um, talking today, please reach out um, to me uh, if you want further information about anything that's being talked about today. And for people in the room, there's material and material and brochures in that corner if you want to collect up a few things uh, from some of the different organisations here today. But I'll give you back to Gail. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, and thank, thanks also to um, all of our um, presenters in that last session. That was fantastic. And, and I think we've sort of ended on a bit of a note where obviously clearly people want to collaborate together. Um, and, you know, there's that very positive sense that there's a lot of really good things happening um, and we need to work together. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are things that we can bring together um, and potentially form into some, um, you know, really strong national programs or national strategies. Um, what I'll do, sorry, I might bring that a bit closer. Um, what I thought I'd do, and I know we're running out of time because uh, everyone wants to, to wrap up um, at three, um, but um, I'll just give, uh, I just want to um, speak about the coalition a little bit more and, and then I'll um, close off with some um, general themes. Um, so, you know, a few people have said, well, what are some of the next steps in, in terms of the coalition, so the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition? There are some things which we will be progressing, and we will really um, welcome the contribution from everybody, whether you're coalition members or otherwise, um, around some of these um, areas and so, uh, some of the strategies. So we, we know that we need to um, really capitalise on the, the current um, work of, of the federal government, but we want to work very closely with state and territory government and, and at local, local government and, and local sort of program areas as well. Um, in the, and I think there's some, not just in our um, proposal document, but in some other material that's been circulated, the coalition's got some key main asks that we will be aiming to progress. So, so key positions that we want to take forward. Um, firstly, we want early language and literacy to be recognised as a focus area within the broader early years policy framework. That goes without saying, that's our sort of key charter. Um, but we, um, in particular, given that the, the, the work around the National Early Years Strategy, we would like to see, um, and it will be embedded in other things, I'm sure, but we would like to see that there is a key priority with key outcomes around um, early language and literacy. We also would like the, the coalition to be viewed and recognised as the specialist um, body in terms of early language and literacy to act as a reference group. And we hope that in terms of further consultations that um, the coalition will be able to be used as a, as a bit of a go-to body um, and to be utilised for advice on future development of the early years strategy. And that, again, you know, would, would no doubt... Um, be in partnership with many other organisations as well. Uh, we ask for and, and hope for uh, that collaboration is fostered between portfolios and coordination between all levels, levels of government and the coalition. Um, and, you know, this is spoken about a little bit in the discussion paper of the early years strategy, but to, it's important that we do reduce silos. Um, as I said before, there's lots of really great things that are occurring and yet sometimes you know it's not known about all this sort of fragmentation around how we kind of collect all of that together and join the dots. Um, there can, can sometimes be competition for limited resources and, and um, missed opportunities if, if we don't work collaboratively so certainly see that that um, is important and working together will we'll be able to achieve the greatest impact. 
Um, as a coalition, we also seek uh, necessary resourcing and funding. We're a body just of like-minded organisations. We're, we're not funded in any sort of way outside the fact that we have had Ian Potter Foundation funding. Um, and um, Nicole's left now, she left earlier, but uh, I did have a, a very useful conversation with her earlier on in the day where she certainly indicated that the Ian Potter Foundation would be interested in further discussions around potentially extending their funding into another round of grants. So that's that's fantastic and we'll, we'll certainly be taking taking her up on that. Um, but otherwise, you know, we also feel that there's a place potentially for government funding, um, that this work can't just, um, you know, go along at a, you know, at, if, if there's not the adequate level of funding and resources, then it goes along at a fairly sort of snail pace um, and we're losing ground and our children are losing ground. So we really need to have that financial support to be able to accelerate the work. Um, there's key priority areas within the, the coalition's proposed strategy. They're around family support within communities, early education and transitions, specialist support and knowledge production and dissemination. So they're all they're sort of the key pillars of our strategy. And I think they're, they're really designed, they were designed through um, um, really looking at best evidence in terms of what's needed. They link together nicely. They create the, the um, uh, connections between the different, um, the different domains in terms of the early years space. Um, in terms of some immediate next steps, there is obviously there's the consultation process in terms of the early year strategy. Um, the coalition will be discussing and hopefully will um, work towards putting in a submission. Um, and I'm sure a number of our own individual organisations will, will be doing that as well. Um, so that's really important. Um, and um, the coalition will be discussing at our next meeting some sort of clear advocacy strategies as well. Um, and one of those things I, I do um, think, particularly based on today's really positive discussions, is that we need to, to do, um, we need to have some clear ways in which we can continue these discussions and, and continue the collaboration. Um, in addition to that national level, uh, the coalition is still very keen to continue our work alongside state and territory colleagues and to support the development and delivery of, of programs on the ground. And, and um, we certainly hope that that will eventually be underpinned by a national framework. Um, but um, certainly uh, the work that's, that's in place now, we want to assist and, and um, um, provide support and reinforce and create those connections across the, uh, the different um, programs that are in place. Um, some themes from me, I guess, in terms of following on from particularly the panel, but um, as well as a number of the other presentations, things that I think are important um, for us in terms of our future work. We obviously need to acknowledge the broader context and the bigger bigger picture, if you like, around the needs of um, Australian children and families. Um, and the factors that create, and I think it was Penny that said the fabric of, of society, uh, they're things that um, certainly, um, while we're talking about early language and literacy, we can't forget all of the other um, key important factors that impact on a child's development. Um, we've talked about poverty, disadvantage, housing, and so on. Um, and all of those, and people coming from, from different nations and, and different, um, potentially different disadvantaged groups. That's essential to our thinking as well. Uh, within that, we need to build upon existing directions and initiatives and focus, and focus on creating integrated, joined up systems and strategies. We need to understand where our strategy might fit into that um, larger early years strategy. It'd be great to have um, uh, to continue the discussions with government. It's a great opportunity at the moment to work with government at all levels and to partner with other organisations um, and to create a, a new future for our children. We talked about it's being important to have a strengths-based lens and, had, and to have conversations around the growth journey towards school for children, uh, but also beyond school. 
And I thought it was um, a nice comment that, that um, Sam Page made um, in the panel that we need a safe road we can all travel on. Uh, and I think that speaks for itself in terms of there needing to be a safe space, but it also speaks to the great positive collaboration that I think we can all bring to the, this area of work. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today and joining us online. Um, I think it's been a, a really positive day. Uh, it's been lovely being able to meet people in person who we've had a lot of contact virtually with before. So that's been nice too, but um, fantastic to have people online join us as well. Um, we, are, we, we will provide, I think, I'm not sure if we've got a report that we're putting together, but we will get some, certainly some summary notes out to all participants as well um, in terms of outcomes of the day. And um, we will maintain that contact in terms of what the coalition's next steps are as well. Just um, as a bit of a reminder for those who aren't sort of shooting off, if you'd like to stay and have um, drinks and a bit of a more of a catch up, we are meeting over at the Hyatt in the Speaker's Corner Bar, I think, is, is that right, Karen? Yep. Um, which is a walk, kind of a long walk, but can, Canberians will know, no doubt. I lost my direction a bit this morning when we came by a taxi, even though it was a very quick ride, but it is quite close by or people will probably know how to get there by car. Um, so thank you once again to all participants and all presenters and speakers on the day. I think it's been fantastic and I really appreciate that you've all joined in these discussions. Thank you. Who, who has done an amazing job, and I nearly didn't do that, but thank you, Kieran. This has been um, a, a very quick piece of work in that we didn't have a lot of time really to bring all of this together, um, but you've done an amazing job, Kieran, and I, I really appreci appreciate your work on this and, and the support of ERACI overall as well. Thank you. Thank you.